All right, I will call to order this meeting of the East Hampton Planning Board for Tuesday, June 18th, 2019. Uh, first up, is there anybody here to speak to anything that is not on the agenda tonight? All right, moving right along. Uh, no minutes. Uh, we've got ANR plan for 201 and 203 East Street. Someone for that? Mark? Yes. Mark Reed from Heritage Surveys representing uh, Northeast Center for Youth and Families. Uh, on the board is an A&R plan that we have submitted that subdivides the approximately 25 acre parcel of land into two parcels having frontage on Fort Hill Road. Uh, the rail trail is on the right hand side of the plan to the um, east of the two buildings that are currently out there. The parcel C-1 contains the school building and parcel C-2 contains the administration building. So the intention is to subdivide the property as shown on the plan. It meets all the setback requirements for zoning to do that. Parcel B, which is the access coming off of East Street into the property, would, would remain the same. There's no changes to A and B that are shown on the plan. Um, I got, I need you to help walk me through this. I see C1, which looks like a, I don't know what you want to call it, an L? Correct. Uh, and it seems to go to Fort Hill Road uh, to the school up to the bike path, is that correct? Yes. Uh, parcel C2, I, I don't really see the, the west side border of it. So the west side border is the Manhan River? It is the river, okay. So the, the whole west side is the actual Manhan River, it goes to the center line of the river, and it and goes all the way up to Fort Hill Road near the, near the bridge. Okay, got it. And I'm sort of under the impression here that you've got three parcels and you're making them into two, is that correct? So no? cur currently, Currently, there's three parcels, um, and really, you're creating a fourth one. Hmm. The parcel A and B off of East Street, are, there's no change. Yeah. And that parcel C, which was the original 25-acre parcel, is being subdivided um, to be, have a 9.7-acre parcel and a 14.6-acre parcel. I see. You're saying C1 and C2 were one thing originally, and they're splitting them into the other. C okay. originally, I'm when the school know. was developed. And the two buildings are not connected by any way? No, any they're way? not. Okay. Currently, there's a, there's a canopy walkway that uh, will be removed okay. between the two. Uh, we met with Jeff and the building inspector um, on that and said the only issue would be to remove the canopy. Uh, it's just a covered walkway. Okay. There's no other than the covered walkway. There's no other physical connection to the two buildings. C1 has 104 point, I think that's 18 frontage. Is that correct? Right. So. So that um, C1 has quite a bit of frontage, um, actually, it's because there's a curve in there, so that it has a total of um, 190 plus another 25 feet, so about 210 feet of frontage, 215 feet of frontage. There's a jog in the roadway, if you can see Fort Hill Road, there's a detail of it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> that. Um, is in there that the city took years ago when they straightened out Fort Hill Road. You can see that on the plan, Fort Hill Road used to loop around. There's a kind of a, mm. a loop to the building and it's, or to the roadway itself. Maybe I'll come up here and show you. Hmm. So Fort Hill Road used to come up here. Mm -hmm. And some years ago, the city straightened out Fort Hill Road and put a new bridge in. It's been an awful long time ago. <laughs> I can't remember that. Are you guys seeing the 200 plus feet for C1 that he's indicating? I see the 104.18. I'm just wondering if you're seeing where the numbers add up there because I'm not quite seeing where that. So there's a curve in the roadway. <clears throat> so you can see there's a the, radius. The bend area. Yeah. And there's another 87 feet um, that is abutting the. 1776 Brewing Company. Okay. So and there, and you add that together with another 25 and another 25 or 50 foot. I'm sorry. <coughs> and C2 is 160 feet plus 25 plus 50. Yep. Plus another plus 96 feet down to the center line of the yeah, river. Okay. And then what's that R35 in there? So it is R35. It's split zone, actually, so that the 
Uh, the school is located in industrial zone, which requires the 140 feet of frontage. Mm -hmm. The parcels A and B are the R35 yeah. zone, which there's no change to those. So the rail trail is the division between the residential and industrial zone. And so A and B aren't being touched by this? Correct. It's just C being split? Correct. Okay. Just C and being split. I see no issues. Yeah, planning department have any comments, questions? No? Anybody else have any questions? Yes, sir. I motion to endorse the ANR for 201 and 203 East Street, Northeast Center for Youth and Families. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstaining? All right. Do we have plans? Thank you for helping to eliminate Welcome. that for me. Yep. Still on the Cannabis is next, and I promise this is the first time I've been waiting for cannabis. Right, moving right along, uh, continued public hearing, amending section 1010 to add cannabis equity applicants. Because we'll open your hearing. Yeah, I have a motion. <coughs> so moved. All in favor? Aye. All right, we're open. <laughs> All right, so we did a little revision work last week. I think the final version is or the most recent version is also up on the screen. Thank you. Jeff, we have the most recent version up there too? Correct. Okay. Um, do you want to walk through what the changes were, Jeff, that we did since last time? Or has everyone had a chance to look at this? Yeah. I've looked at the, the, the records. Yeah, I mean, I think what happened at the last meeting is there was a, um, a variety of discussions, but there was some language that got condensed, um, mainly with regard to the permitting process um, that would be established for equity applicants versus non-equity applicants. So um, nothing in the definitions has changed. Um, for, the, for the purposes of clarity, I accepted a lot of the track changes that were in the previous version and just laid out the ones that are uh, to be discussed tonight. Um, so <clears throat> the ordinance has the definition for East Hampton equity applicant, which has not changed. Um, this strike outline for ownership got incorporated to a later section. Um, the majority of the changes happened in, in this um, 4.4 section. So as of right now, the number of uh, cannabis retailers is set for eight, um, and that is something to finalize <coughs> tonight's discussion. But the language got consolidated to to basically divide it into two groups: um, the East Hampton equity applicant and non-equity, and then special permits will be apportioned to five non-equity retailers and three equity applicants. So that was based on the discussion last time. I think that that's where this group. They make a final recommendation on the number of licenses. Um, 
4.5 <coughs> is language that was largely the same um, except the last sentence um, gives some deference to an equity applicant where they can apply for a special permit before they apply at the State Cannabis Control Commission. Um, <coughs> this next paragraph is part of 4.5 and um, I did insert, so this, is, this was the discussion about information to determine ownership. So this is basically the application requirements. Um, we're, we're, we're attaching the ownership, the second to last sentence, ownership documentation shall be the same as is required for the State Cannabis Commission. And then I did insert this last sentence based <coughs> on some of the discussion to just ensure that the planning board may require additional information be submitted as part of the application process. Because if something changes down the road, it gives the planning board to at least ask for some additional documentation. Sense. And then uh, 4.6 was some, it's, it's, it's the, to set out that um, if, if future licenses are to be added, so above eight, for example, that they shall be um, added in such a way that it, it continues to make it more equitable. And so I think, Jesse, you had some language that got inserted here to just make it clearer that the ordinance shall be set up that way, not necessarily the number of licenses. Right. I think when we talked about it last time, it was, it was written as a number of equity retailers had to equal the non-equity. And I think the intent was the number of licenses available would be equal so you wouldn't be held up if one category wasn't full. <coughs> The number of licenses available. Yeah, so you could, you, it, it, so let's imagine a scenario where there's five non equity licenses that mm -hmm. are granted and three equity applicant licenses. In order to go up to add anything, you would have to add two more One on each. equity, but you, you, they wouldn't have to be taken. So you could, you could add a sixth. You could make it six and six in that scenario gotcha. for the next non-equity applicant. You wouldn't have to wait for there to be mm -hmm. five completed. Gotcha. That's, that reads correctly then. And it's important, of course, to note that that would also require that it be modified again to increase from the eight limit to some higher number. Yeah. Right. Well, we also discussed last time, I mean, we're drafting a bylaw that binds city council, but they can, of course, amend their bylaws themselves, so it's a little more statement of intent than an actual. Council? One thing that's been in the back of my mind and kind of, to kind of for a variety of things with this discussion, especially about numbers and, and trying to figure out the mechanics behind um, the, uh, the equity application process and kind of putting the word out there too and letting people get their ducks in a row. And you could tell me if this is impossible. Harley was wondering if we should include language that basically doesn't allow the um, uh, the equity special permits to be allowed to like let's just say like June 2020, which allows the city time to kind of figure out how the process is going to work. Let people who are interested figure out how um, they're going to apply, <coughs> get, their, get everything in order, and I think it also potentially well, some of the concerns of like suddenly, you know, adding more numbers, which while I think there, I think there's, you know, there's valid, well I, well, I don't think, well, I personally didn't think that that was an issue. I think it addresses kind of that concern of sudden, like the sudden increase. Mm -hmm. So it's just a thought. What, um, what, what procedures or ducks in a row does the city need to do between now and June of 2020? Um, I mean, I think you'd probably have to shore up on the planning side in terms of exactly how you're going to either, um, if someone comes forward and they, they have, they, they want to offer proof, I think mm -hmm. we should have to think more about exactly what we're going to own, uh, we're, we're going to require as proof of ownership or what other documentation we might request. Um, and I say we, meaning Jeff, <laughs> uh, and the planning board. Um, uh, just to kind of plan out exactly, I mean, we're putting, we're here we're drawing up a blueprint, but we need to then figure out how we're going to implement the blueprint. Um, so again, it was just a thought to kind of also mitigate some of the concerns around this as well. Should those requirements be in the regulations, in the ordinance? 
I mean, I think like for the ownership one, we've defined it as those documents included in the CMR that the Cannabis Control Commission would require. And we can certainly, we under this proposed language, we have the ability to ask for additional stuff. Um, I don't know that there, I mean, I, I don't know that there's stuff that we really need to get ready to start taking applications once this gets handled, but I also don't know that there isn't an independent reason to delay it if that's something that people are interested in. It's fine with me. I mean, it's, it's my legislation. I just just like <laughs> yeah, yeah. Trying, trying to offer like kind of some, you know, compromise and some of the discussions I've heard here and listening to input yeah. from the public. So I, don't, I just was putting that out there. I think the thought's good. I'd like to add a counterpoint. Um, it, the legislation as itself or this modification for equity is in and of itself a big slowdown. As we've discovered, very few of these applications have come through through the CCC. Um, putting an additional slowdown on top of that would likely be more hindrance to, to equity applicants than anything else. And it, it may be that there's a group that wants to slow this down a little bit, and, and that's what we're here discussing. Definitely, without a doubt, putting this in place and raising the number to eight may seem like it's speeding things up or increasing, but it's not. Three of those being equity and one being pulled away from the regular number, given that the CCC is barely processing these at all, I, I, what we're really doing is reducing the number mm -hmm. of fa facilities that we have and slowing down this process dramatically. Mm -hmm. So I, I think adding additional slowdowns on top of the slowdown is unnecessary. Okay. But, but I think your heart's in the right place because pe I think people need to understand what this is. You might look at this and say, we're going from six to eight. No, we're, we're really not. We're adding three equity and then taking six and bringing it to five from regular people. And there's right. very few. From regular people. people. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, inappropriately term, whatever, yeah. but not equity, that's probably better. Yes. So, but we're also hoping to make it easier for not, for equity applicants, right? So the hope is, exactly. like we talked about this at the last meeting, you know, the numbers for the state so far have been pretty dismal, and I think they would be the first ones to admit that, so I think their process is changing a lot of things are hopefully going to make equity applicants more common and then more available. Let's hope. I mean, that's the goal. But right now, the state is definitely not there. We're not there. And I think adding in additional delays on top of it would be unnecessary. No, that's a point well taken, a uh, counterpoint well taken. I appreciate <laughs> that. And I was just trying to be thoughtful and responsive. And I think I think to comment on some, what, what at least some, some of the discussions I've had, the reason why it's not happening as much is because there's not availability. Like the program that we're setting, the reason that you're not seeing more, <coughs> more applicants from the state is because there's no doors open for them. And so by doing this and other municipalities doing this, I think it will potentially make the program more successful at the state level. So, mm -hmm. hope so. I'm good. I have a question just about, sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say that I think the way it's set up, and this was part of the discussion last time, if you look at um, 7.4.3, um, the discussion last time was that any special permit granted to an equity applicant shall lapse um, if a completed application with the Cannabis Commission is not obtained within six months from the filing of the decision with the clerk. And I think what that's going to do, I don't, I don't necessarily have any concerns with the ability to gather enough information about ownership. I think attaching it to the, you know, we want an applicant who knows the next step. Right. So the next step is they have to submit all their documentation and ownership documents with the state. So as long as I, we can connect it to that process, I think we can get a reasonable amount of information in front of the planning board. And then I think just that last clause was that if there are unknowns or points of confusion, the planning board has the authority to, to continue to ask for additional information at that point. So I, I don't think that that's a, a cause for concern to, to have ducks in a row, so to speak. Okay, like I said, I was just trying to, it was, it was an idea I was throwing out there. And I mean, personally, I'm, I'm more than happy to have it implemented right away. I just wanted to, my openness right. to compromise any other comments or questions from yeah, just one yeah um, when and this is just specifically on how to write an ordinance but is it, it to say something like the planning board may require additional information be submitted as part of the application process is that too open-ended for an ordinance do we have to specify what that might be a, like possible proof of I, mean, I, think, I think the point here is that we don't know what that would be. I think that yep. in the context of, of proof of ownership, that sort of, that paragraph, I think, sort of limits it. You're right. I mean, we try not to have the vague standards, but I think where it's a question of the planning board requiring additional information, 
It's not a standard to be met. It's more that we can ask for documents that we need to satisfy us who owns the actual entity. Okay. Yeah, I think have a recollection that that was the motivating thing is that we needed some way to determine who the actual owner is. Right, was. right. And we've tied it to a CMR, but the CMR can change. They can move the CMR. Like, you don't want to look around and realize that we, we have a list that we, did. we didn't list the documents. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that that was it's a acceptable problem. language from a, just a writing it standpoint. I was just looking at my understanding is that you know, with the special permit in general, you know, claim board always has the authority to request more information until you have enough information to make yeah. a decision. I, right. I, I was trying to thumb through. I I can't recall if actually it's this ordinance, but it's pretty common for this language to exist. It is. Just okay. to give the authority to continue to make sure that the claim board can get enough information. That's all I need to know. So. Thank you. Um, so just scrolling through the rest of the document. Yep. I do not think that there are actually any other changes. So um, we just talked about these, the section here. Um, <clears throat> we talked earlier, this is 7.4.2, the equity applicant co could apply for a special permit before submitting to the state with the notion that they would, th they'd have to submit at the state within six months. Mm -hmm. um, um, 7.4.4, which is a condition of approval for any equity applicant shall require that any change in ownership or control of the establishment that is submitted to the com commission shall trigger the need for a new special permit. I mean, I think it's a little clunky, but we talked last time that because it's going to be based on this ownership structure, if they change it, you know, they're going to have we to come back. We should know about it. Yeah, yeah. Yep. I think that's yep. good. I like that language. Um, that's just renumbering, and so I think that that was, you know, I think the remaining the remaining question is just about the recommendation from at this joint hearing on the number. Okay. Of licenses. Five and three eight total. What were the alternatives that have been proposed? I think last time we talked about five and two. Um, I don't. There was some back and forth, and we I think just decided to get these changes and come back this time and and see where people landed. But um, if we don't have any other comments or questions up here, I'd like to see if anyone, anybody from the public, comments or questions. All right. Mm -hmm. So I guess what are people's thoughts about the numbers? I'm good with them as they are. I'm ready to approve personally. Okay, that's fine. All right. I have no okay. objection. Five and three. Five and three. Okay. Um, then I guess we're, this is a formally a recommendation from us to the city council, right? So I guess we'll take a motion to recommend. I motion to recommend the uh, equity modification to the adult use cannabis section of our zoning to the City Council. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? All right. You can make it's your more. hands now. Two. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's not I unheard of. I move it to the full council. Yep. Um, I'll make a motion to accept these changes as, as outlined here uh, to modify the recreational cannabis with the equity revisions. Uh, to the full council. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. All right. Thank you, Thank you guys. Well done. Good luck the rest of the way. Uh, motion to adjourn. Uh, second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, okay. Close the vote. Very nice. Same thing. Okay. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> All right. Moving right along. Great. Public hearing on Beacon Solar LLC seeking a special permit under section 7.3 and 12.7 to construct a four megawatt two array system of 20 acres. 28 acres. 50 <coughs> Florence Road. Yeah. Anyone here to present on that? Come on down. Uh, I need to oh, use myself right. from this discussion as I am one of the engineers that is involved in this project. So All right. cool. I will step aside. You'll be missed. Can I sit in the audience or no? Do I have to step That's out of the room? Yeah. It's really better. <laughs> okay, I'll go in that back listen. room. I'll come, come on, home. <laughs> <coughs> All right. I have some <coughs> of the stuff that I can try to mirror along with you guys on the sure. screen yeah. as you go. Yeah, yeah. If it's helpful, uh, you can start by putting like the first page or second page of the civil set, okay. just for reference. Um, it's also out here. Uh, we can turn it towards the public if you wish to see. 
that's also fine. Mr. Chairperson, do you have a preference where they orient the, the board? Um, well, maybe if you move it back a little bit, then we can all see it. <laughs> further, further away, yeah. Is this okay with the light? Can people see the screen in the back? Yeah, the yeah. Pages, okay. Uh, Jeff can, Jeff can move around when they go. tell us what to look at. Okay. <laughs> Whenever you're ready. Whenever you're ready. Okay, great. We'll lay it on us. Uh, <laughs> gentlemen of the planning board, uh, we are here tonight to present you a 4 megawatt AC, 6 megawatt DC solar PV array um, called Beacon Solar. Um, the mother company is Cypress Creek, which I represent. I'm the project manager, Nico Galatou, for this project. And I have with me here tonight Bradford Saunders from GI Consultants and Ethan Winter, who also works for Cypress Creek. I'm sorry, Nico Galatou. I know, it's a tough last name. <laughs> Nico is the first name. And ICO. Yeah, correct. OK, so I'm going to start by walking you over um, the project, giving you some information, and then I hand it over to Brad, who is going to go into the specifics. Great. Um, so this project is, as I said, four megawatts AC, six megawatts DC. To give you an idea, this project powers about 700 homes annually. Um, it is on Florence Road. Our access is to the northeast of this parcel um, that we will go over in a little bit. The project is over two parcels, totaling about 135 acres. We are developing only in about 25% of those 135 acres, about 33 acres. This is like the limit of the fence. Um, we started development on this project in 2017, so we've been working actively on this for two years now. Um, there will be, and I'm very happy to say this, no tree clearing on this project. None. Um, none. Zero. Um, which we're very proud of. We're also not impacting any wetlands. We're going to go over that in a little bit more detail later on. This project is a community solar project. Um, people of East Hampton and neighbor towns are going to have an opportunity to subscribe to this community program and get a reduction on their electricity bill on a monthly basis. Um, we are going to be selling electricity to Wimico. Uh, this is the acronym for Eversource West. And subscribing into the SMART program, which is the renewable energy program put forward by the state of Massachusetts to incentivize renewable energy and solar development. Um, we know that this yeah. project fits in as well with the town of East Hampton's goals. Um, We've done extensive research on the town. We know that you are a model for sustainability. Um, you have the first landfill project, a city-owned landfill project in Massachusetts. Um, congratulations on that. Um, this project is going to be about double the size and will bring about double the benefits, both in economic terms and energy, to the town. We're going to go over that in a little bit. So I'm going to stop here and ask if anyone has any questions on anything that I've said until here, because I know it's a lot of information. On page five of your presentation, you said uh, that virtually all the proposed solar installation, including shade setback, will be sited within areas currently cleared of tree cover. Access will be attained through the use of existing farm access drive. Accordingly, virtually, uh, no clearing of natural vegetation will be required. And you just said no trees will not need to come down. The virtually, does that mean some shrubs and light stuff that's on the ground? What, what does the virtually mean? On the, on the way, if there are any shrubs, I mean, we walk the sites and I, I, I'm pretty certain that we won't have to do any tree clearing, so to speak. But if there are sh shrubs that prevent the trucks from accessing, yes, those will be taken out. And I just had one more quick question here, and I'm sure there'll be many as we come. But I feel I should get this one out of the way early just in case, because I can save us all a lot of time. Do you have your presentation, this document, this booklet that you gave us on page 10? Uh, in in uh, the very first prior paragraph, it says that as a national leader in solar energy and a partner with many communities in Massachusetts already, CCR is the right partner for the town of Ludlow. Are you in the right place? <laughs> I just wanted to make sure. This is obviously a typo. Okay. So, <laughs> sorry about that. All right. We have sorry, a I had to throw it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for pointing that down, though. I appreciate it. Um, 
Okay, just to give you a little bit more information um, as to the size of this project and the, the amount of benefits that it can bring to the town. Um, so as I said before, it can power 700 homes annually. Um, it takes the equivalent about 820 cars off the road every year. That's 4,000 tons of CO2 per year. Um, that's the offset, that is. It will bring significant tax revenue to the town. Um, our initial calculations and discussions with the assessor's office um, bring the number to a slightly over a million dollars. Over, um, the cor oh, over the course of the, over the, how, how yes, do you calculate not per, the not per year, over, over the lifetime of the project. Yes, 20 years. absolutely. 20 years. Yeah, that's 20 years. 20 years. Yeah. Right. Okay, with that. That's a guarantee. Yes. Yes. We are, we are still negotiating the pilot, but our initial calculations and discussions with the town lead to that number. It might be higher. Before we go, I want to ask you one question about that. You just tossed out some numbers and things. Uh, jobs were something that I saw you mentioned in here, too, is one of the benefits. Did you want to wait and it was someone else going to talk about that, or is that? No, I'm happy to talk it, about you that. You said something about approximately 60 full-time jobs yeah. during the installation of this, I'm sure. Correct. Can About 60 full-time equivalent jobs during the construction and installation of the facility. Yeah. And it says that these jobs will be locally filled provided the qualified labor is available. H how is that tracked? How do we know? Correct. Uh, so whenever possible, it, I think it's in the best interest of both parties to source everything locally. It reduces transportation costs, obviously. So what we do is we look out for qualified labor in the towns that we work in. Um, it's the same thing with sourcing of materials. Uh, we try to go local as much as possible. Just to give you an idea, the approximate investment for a project like this on our end is about $8 million. And of those, again, those are estimates based on previous projects that we've done. Um, of those $8 million, about $5 million are going to be uh, spent in the local economy. I like the intention, but it's really an honor thing. You're saying trust us to make sure it'll be local. Yes, and we, we can we can think about creative ways to track this. Yeah, it's very hard on, on a I understand part for part basis, but yeah, but this is our intention. Are you having difficulty hearing? Is that yeah. okay? Yeah. So is that oh, sure. You, can, you can't hear me. And that microphone is really for the audience at home, so just project a little louder. Yeah, so that records. Okay. It doesn't really amplify. Oh, thank you. Got it. Okay. Okay. So I speak louder then. Thank you. Okay. Very we do have one more question over here. Oh, yeah, Perry. How long does it take to build this thing? So the construction period is about 12 to 16 weeks. So you're creating 64 jobs for 6 to 18 weeks. 60, yeah, more and or less. Then what happens? These mm -hmm. got to go someplace else. Well, there's maintenance jobs over the lifetime of the project. Um, but yeah, those 60 jobs, and I, I want to be very clear on that, are during the construction of the project. I had one more in this vein, and we're yeah. just sort of talking about this summary information. At the very bottom of that, you said during the operational life of the project, local, inv local investment is expected to exceed $38,000 annually. Of what? what? What is, where are you putting that money? Where, where was this investment going? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so we run numbers on the equipment that we change up every year. Um, people who come to do site maintenance, stay in local hotels. Um, you know, transportation, gas, all of that is factored into that final number. Okay, so it's almost like uh, your, the tourism element, the people that are coming here are gonna use the restaurants, fuel their trucks, et cetera. And the servicing of the farm, yeah, yeah. All right, sorry with those interruptions, I just no, wanted to clear that up. That's what I'm here for, <laughs> yeah. Okay, with that, if there are no other questions, I will hand it off to... I, I did have John just Right. Well, hold on. If you, it, let's wait. Well, you know what? If you have a question about what he's just talked yes. about, okay, why don't you come up here and introduce oh. yourself and oh. just because we got to record everything. So, right. do I stand I yeah. back? Yeah, right next no. to name and address. He'll step <laughs> back for a minute. Don't worry. <laughs> you got to bite your Hi. Uh, I'm Doug Rauscher. Uh, we have Heritage Farm at 30 Florence Road. <clears throat> you said the ac you're going to use the, the existing access road through that farm. That's correct. No other access. Okay. Uh, Will that culvert accommodate the weight of whatever your vehicles are? We're going to get to that in just a oh. second. <laughs> in just a second. Right. Is that what he just said? Yeah. Let's, let's let him finish, then we'll have plenty of time oh, for more questions. That's okay. OK. No problem. Hand it off to Bradford now, who's going to go over the site plan in a little, in a little <coughs> more detail. <laughs> 
Thank you, Nico. Before I go any further, just want to let you all know that only my mother calls me Bradford, so uh, it's Brad. <laughs> um, there's just a couple of things that I really wanted to do to touch on, and that was really related to the approval criteria that you have in your ordinance. Uh, I also wanted to touch briefly on the wetlands issues on the site. There's uh, approximately 137 acres to this property, of which some 28 are bordering vegetated wetlands. There's also a number of stream channels, particularly intermittent stream channels that connect the different wetlands uh, together. There's a perennial stream, Bassett Brook, that's to the northwest of the property. And as a result, there's this riverfront area that comes in there. Uh, but one of the things we wanted to point out is that we're staying completely out of the wetlands. Uh, we're maintaining at least a 25-foot setback, except, of course, where the existing roadway crosses the wetlands in some, some locations. We're going to be using those exact same locations for our crossings. Uh, and in fact, the roadway is going to be a 20-foot wide uh, gravel-based road, except where it approaches a wetland and crosses the wetland. That, at that point, they'll narrow down to 12 feet in width. And I checked with the fire department to make sure that that was an adequate width for their equipment. And uh, they said, yes, they could, they could deal with the 12-foot the width. Did so as a result, a we're able to front? stay within the same footprint okay. of the existing crossings. So anyway, going through the through the standards, uh, I want to try to keep this as not as dry as possible, but <laughs> uh, they are pretty straightforward, and I wanted to touch on them for the record. Uh, so outdoor lighting must be limited to that required for safety and operational purposes. There will be no outdoor lighting required for this project, so there won't be any. Uh, signage must comply with the city's sign ordinance. We have done so. The signage <coughs> will be limited to the emergency contact information. That will be provided at the entrance from Florence Road, two by two uh, sign for that. There's also signage for emergency and warning signs as required. Um, reasonable efforts are to be made to place all utility connections underground. We have been able to do that except in areas where we're going to be crossing the wetlands uh, because we don't want to excavate the wetlands to put the, uh, the transmission lines underneath them. We also have the issue of possible water infiltration into those lines. So where we have multiple wetlands involved, rather than going under and back up and down and, and up, they'll continue to be just overhead lines in those areas. But within the areas of the uh, solar arrays themselves, they'll all be underground. Can you describe an overhead line? How tall are we talking? This pole? How tall are those poles? I want to say about 15 feet. 15 or 50? 15. 15? Okay. It's similar to other power poles that you see on the streets. And they all exist within your fenced-in area? Uh, no. No. The fenced-in area is around the solar arrays themselves, not the poles. So we have actually two pointing to the plan. There's a, the fence goes around the array here, mm -hmm. and it also goes around the array here. So as a result, there are two gates, one going into this array and one before you get to that array. Okay? And the poles connect the two. I said the poles connected. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, Jeff. Um, whether it's now or later, I think that there should be some additional discussion about uh, the 15-foot pole height, the number of poles visible yep. on the street, and where exactly these lines are above ground. Because it seems like it's <coughs> along the north access route. So I think whether yeah. it's now or later, I think that that may be worth exploring. Yeah. Do, do you have some detail. detail on that? Yes, they're on the plans. Yep. Okay. And uh, it is from this point to the entrance because we draw them up from here, we draw them up from here. We've got that main crossing right there. 
So for that, that stretch, it is above. Uh, similarly, from from here to there is also above ground. Can you say that again? I didn't actually. The, the, so from the, the stretch between the two arrays. So, so this the, so stretch in here is also has above ground. So really, the, the vast majority of the transmission lines will be above ground because of these wetlands are uh, Outside of the... Other than within right. the arrays the themselves. Outside arrays themselves. Okay. And it is because of the extensive wetlands. Yep, okay. Can I ask gonna, where the transmission lines are? Hold, hold on. We're going we're gonna to wait for questions, all right? We'll get to it, I promise. Um, and then at the street, and, and this can be discussed further later, but at the, along the street where the dwelling is shown, there is a series of... How many poles are lined up together there at the street? Six. Six. Is so, that delineated so anywhere on any of these maps that I have? Do we have yes. a map that has yes. the poles with dots? On the single set, every single pole that would be put in yeah. is a little circle, back circle. Okay, which, which map is There's that? There's a detail at the very end of the packet that I thought did a good job of showing where, where they are. And I don't mean to belabor this. I think there's plenty more to discuss. Oh, there it is. C502. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's the detail. Okay, and we can discuss it in further detail later. I, I just, it's worth discussing mm -hmm. again. Okay. Um, we just went over the preventing unauthorized access for the fence. Uh, all appurtenant structures will be subject to reasonable dimensional requirements and are to be architecturally compatible with one another. The uh, only structures really other than the, the poles and the, the racks for the, for the uh, panels themselves are the transformers, the uh, battery storage facility, the inverter. And those are essentially are going to be in a structure that's similar to a storage or a shipping container. Where is that on the map? Those are we, we, there are actually two of them. The, right the two darker, yeah. One here in black. Yeah. And the other one is right there. And tell me again what's in those? Transformers. Yeah. Uh, inverter. Those are the things that pe people generally complain about, even though I saw lots of documentation that says they don't make noise. People, neighbors will typically complain that they make noise. You've got them boxed in. Yes, they're, they're well into the site. That's good. And I would add to that, they're boxed in and they're in the middle of the array. Yeah. yeah. So they're as far as possible from the boundaries of the parcels. Okay. Um, Are there locks on those doors internally for, the, for those? I know you have the locked gate external. But but the the little sheds I don't know what you want to call them whatever they are are those locked as well? The storage storage containers that hold like the battery storage. Well, so. I would have to get back to you on that. But okay. Safe, yeah, uh, when reasonable structures should be screened from view by vegetation and or clustered to avoid adverse visual impact. Uh, that's similar to the next one, which is. Clearing of natural vegetation should be limited to that necessary for construction and <coughs> operation. I'm going to uh, let Nico talk about visual impacts once I'm done with this. So sure. We'll just move past that for right now. The facilities are to be designed and constructed to optimize maintenance of wildlife corridors. I've looked at a lot of uh, solar ordinances throughout the state. That's the first one I've seen that, that had that on it which is dear to my heart because I'm a wildlife biologist by training. Uh, it's a good, uh, good idea. I don't know why it came up <laughs> in, uh, in the development of your ordinance. But on this particular site, uh, clearly we've, we've adhered to that by focusing on only using the existing fields. We've maintained all of the existing corridors on the site. And uh, one thing I want to point out is that once the facility is built, there's going to be very little in the way of activity on the site from the standpoint of maintenance. So uh, wildlife will have quite a, a free reign to use those corridors uh, without disturbance. We have about it, a million it, questions. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to just in, in the past, you know, we've used that language to sort of reduce the option for a developer to say fence both or all three arrays within one section, right, where the fencing blocks off 
a huge parcel as opposed to having gaps in the fencing where animals can get through and that sort of so the done. fact that we've got our security fencing the way it is yes works well it works that, right? well that 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 qualifies as, as protecting those corridors you just mentioned uh the maintenance traffic you also <coughs> mentioned the road in the beginning and i want to touch on both of those uh, if you're the right person to answer those questions so the maintenance traffic how often do you uh think someone will come to perform maintenance here it's on the order of once a month once a month yeah so we're seeing like from a traffic standpoint 30 35 trips per year no I have a pretty good sense of this because that's been on an average year. a few array projects before but can you describe what that's like someone drives up in a truck what happens yeah, I think he's best day. Can you just come over by the microphone again for those the millions of viewers at home? <laughs> <laughs> and abroad. And abroad. Thank you. Famous after tonight. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so what does the maintenance look like? Um, so basically, yes, as he said, it's one or two cars per month max. And what they do is they ensure that the array is functioning correctly. They conduct service sometimes. Um, it could be servicing an inverter, changing a single panel, stuff like that. It's never more than a single car that parks up at the site and does the inspection. And is there any remote monitoring or anything like that to sort of see if there's a problem? I mean, obviously there's not someone there 24-7, but... Absolutely. We have a operations and maintenance uh, center that operates 24-7. Um, everything is monitored from afar, um, so as soon as there's a problem, it's detected and we know about it and we act on it by way of the uh, function of the grid not by cameras or drones no <laughs> not yet <laughs> but no no right. yeah same thing with the battery um, all of that is monitored um, we control them at distance so we can decide when we want to charge or discharge from the panels yeah. thank you Jesse. Oh, uh, th this is the water guy right the guy on the left water that's water Brian. Guy. Brad. Water guy. <laughs> Yeah. All right. In a worst case scenario, we have a big hurricane. We got 14 inches of rain. Okay, it's all going to go on your panels, and it's all. Where's it all going to go? Is it running down the hill into somebody's front yard, or where's it going to go? It's it's going to flow the way it does right now. Well, hold on, hold on. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Is that gonna? Is that gonna? We're not changing the drainage characteristics of the site. Is there a problem up there right now with water getting into people's front yards, or what, what's happening? You must have researched that whole thing all out, I would imagine, right? Yeah. Not, I haven't, but we're, our design here is to maintain the drainage system <coughs> and the drainage on the site. That was, that was just one of the biggest kind of concerns. I was at a conservation meeting back about three or four months ago, and with a lot of people really concerned about water going into their front yard. Yeah. I'm happy, I'm happy to all take right. that. So I'd like to have somebody address that issue, please. So I think the issue that you're referring to is erosion and stormwater runoff and existing conditions versus what we're going to do, right? So I, I care about those issues a lot and in sites where there is steep grading or an elevation loss that we change drastically, we worry about those things. Luckily enough, this site is mostly flat. We're moving very little dirt around and we have put together a stormwater plan which will be then complemented by a SWIP. It's a stormwater pollution prevention plan. It's in accordance with Mass DEP that shows that the runoff will not be affected after construction. So we're maintaining and even sometimes improving in the case of this site because of like the amount of wetlands that are on site, we're improving runoff after. And this will be reviewed by the town's engineer and staff. Okay. All right. I'll put, can I put a little bit more detail to that? So the Conservation Commission, in a case like this, um, it has a notice of intent application. So some of the abutters are going to get notice for this meeting with the Planning Board. There's another meeting, the first meeting of which will be June 24th with the Conservation Commission. So the way it's set up is that because the notice of intent um, is required, the Conservation Commission is going to administer the city's stormwater ordinance. So they are going to get input from the city engineer and make decisions based on um, that or a third party review or some other information on uh, confirming that what the applicant just stated is true. So the planning board does not have the jurisdiction over the stormwater. It's going to be the conservation commission. Does that explain why we didn't have the SWIP or stormwater in our packet? Correct. <laughs> and, and typically, in the chair can correct yep. if I'm wrong, well, the, the process sense. is typically that 
the planning board will um, um, withhold their final issuance of the special permit until the conservation commission is satisfied and issues their permit so the, the biggest picture is that the planning board is going to be informed by the conservation commission and will incorporate that into their decision making process is that, is that, that that's that's entirely accurate we i mean we defer to them to do the first level of looking at the stormwater. they're the experts on that and then when we get that we review that as part of our final determination but we have a pretty strict policy here of not approving any of these permits until Conscom has, has approved or, or implemented a stormwater plan. So we're satisfied and they're satisfied. And we have uh, just recently submitted the notice of intent to the Conservation Commission with the stormwater analysis in it. I think one thing I wanted to point out is that we are not increasing impervious surfaces on this site. Mm -hmm. uh, the roadway is pervious. The solar arrays will remain pervious. Uh, so we really are trying to maintain existing infiltration to the soils on this property. The one thing that, that will be different that uh, was, was mentioned earlier about culverts. Mm -hmm. uh, we will be replacing the existing culverts at the crossings. Can you show me where on the map those culverts yep. are? One there. It's in the road, right? Yep. Yeah. Uh, That's there's, existing road. There's one here. Can, is there I, just a quick question on that road? There's an existing road coming in. Are you extending it at some point? Are you building new road, or is there existing road the entire length of where you're going? The existing road essentially goes the entire length of where we're going. I Are think they said sort of they're guy, they're, they're the going to right there. And yes. Right, and there's going to be some improvements made. You said right about putting down the gravel and gravel. And, and, right. right. So so you. In in some cases, the the road will be 25 uh, 20 feet in width except where it crosses the wetlands, where it will take you down to 12. So where the existing road out there now, which is just sort of helter skelter, where it's 30 feet, it'll now be 20 feet. Where it's You're gonna 18 grade feet, it. it'll be 20 feet. Different types of gravel or one, I mean, what can you tell me a little bit about what exactly you're going to be doing? Act, actually, there's a detail in the so I saw the back, but for the sheet. Since you know, the audience here doesn't have access to that, can you tell me a little bit about it? Uh, only to the extent of what's on the detail for you. <laughs> uh, the intent, though, is essentially you are redoing the road. Yes. It, yes. Yes, because it'll, it will be a different surface than what's out there right now. And you will be replacing the two existing culverts that exist in the road currently? There's more than two. Okay. But two of them you're replacing the others? No, no, no. No, there's more. No. Okay. We're replacing them all. All of them. Okay. So. I only got to two. Before. Yeah, sorry. It's <laughs> just how else. it is. We're tough. <laughs> okay. There's one there. Okay. There's uh, one here. Yeah. There's one here. Okay. There's one here. And oh, excuse me, right here. And then there's one here. Five. Then. I think I said, wasn't that? Did I get four? <laughs> Five with the one out by the. Yeah. Okay. The last yeah. one. I think. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Super helpful. That, that's good. I, I need to understand. And again, those are all detailed on the plans. Yep. So I'm going to pull yep. up the detail for the road. Would you mind describing it um, briefly? And, and just to clarify, we, so we have the package and the plans, and we've looked through them a lot, but everyone else hasn't been given that opportunity. So sometimes we're asking questions. So, that in some cases, the, the new culvert will be uh, PVC, mm -hmm. and in some other cases, it's uh, reinforced concrete. Yeah. So, Jeff, thank you. Larry. And that was all based on the hydrology study done by the engineers. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, Jeff, you're you're right on point. It's right there. It's C29, I believe. C29. C29. It's number two gravel, mm -hmm. and that's the road. Yeah. It's just regular gravel that we put there. Okay. Mm -hmm. But it's excavated and prepared with a sub base of it, it does, does the have dimension a sub -base say how deep it, the gravel is and i can, that's sorry because the computer's not caught six up with inch, eight inches, six, inch, six inch. inches okay. and that's something that the specification for the fire department has been satisfied with we haven't heard otherwise yeah we're, we haven't received any comments from any departments right jeff correct not as of this point okay and you did say you talked with the fire department Exactly. I think it'd be Specifically wonderful. about the width of the road at the wetland crossings. Mm -hmm. I think it'd be wonderful to get a statement from them. Okay. So yeah. keep that in mind. Okay. All right, Brad, we interrupted you while you were going through the standards. If you want to jump that's, back in. That's okay. <laughs> uh, 
An undisturbed natural vegetative buffer shall be maintained between the, again, we'll talk about the, the visual and okay. uh, vegetation buffer. Uh, city amenities abutting properties are to be protected through minimization of detrimental or offensive uses. Uh, they've been, the facilities have been cited on the property to avoid these impacts. There are visual impacts that we're aware of, and again, we'll talk about those in a moment. Uh, traffic and safety impacts, again, very few trips uh, from this project, so there's virtually no, no traffic impacts. There will be some traffic during the construction period, uh, up to 30 vehicle trips per day from the site, but that's a 12 to 16 week period. Uh, the next one talks about sewage disposal, refuse, uh, those obviously don't apply uh, on this particular project. Uh, we have addressed the stormwater drainage issue, and again, that'll be discussed in much more detail with the Conservation Commission. Uh, methods of protecting wetlands, watersheds, aquifers, and well areas are to be adequate. We believe we've, we've done that. Again, it'll be discussed with the Conservation Commission, but staying out of the wetlands, utilizing the existing crossings, maintaining at least a 25-foot setback at all locations, I think achieves that. Uh, impacts to city resources, including water supply and distribution system, sewage uh, collection and treatment, fire protection, streets are to be mitigated. Uh, again, the uh, fire department uh, is, needs to review the, the plans, uh, but we believe we're, we're certainly not using any of the water supply. We're not generating any sewage, aside from the construction workers, but even that'll probably be water parties, right? <laughs> uh, provisions for off-street loading and unloading of vehicles, parking, lighting, uh, traffic controls should be sufficient. We have really two parking spaces on the property, one for each of the transformer battery storage areas, and uh, the lay-down area for construction is located internal to the site right here. That's temporary for construction storage equipment. Quick question for you. That yep. side up there where the lay down is, is that the side that is potentially abutting uh, residences? I know there's one side that's potentially abutting residences. Can you just point that out to me? Uh, yes, it's, it's actually it's beyond where the residences are. This is the Lathrop community right there above up in here. Uh, so it's beyond that, and um, there's an existing vegetation area along that area and separating. And you mentioned in here somewhere a building, I think I saw, you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that you were planning on putting a uh, vegetative buffer in there, so some, some trees, some plants. Well, again, we'll talk about that. When will we talk about that? <laughs> Once I'm done with this. Okay, come on. Neil, Nico's come back up and do <laughs> Nico's all of the visual stuff. All right, all right, we'll give you the benefit of the data. Uh, <laughs> vegetative buffers again we'll talk about that area over which existing vegetation is to be removed is to be minimized I think we've talked about that uh, no trees to be removed consistency of the development with respect to setback areas placement of parking we've met that measures to prevent pollution of surface and groundwater to minimize erosion and changes in groundwater levels um, again, that's a stormwater issue. Uh, methods to prevent the project uh, from being a nuisance due to unacceptable air or water pollution, excessive noise, or visually flagrant structures. <coughs> and that's pretty much it. So you can see that probably five or six of the items have to do with visual, visual impacts. So with that, I'll go back to Nico. All right. Thanks, Brad. First, like to show you <coughs> what don't we have call any of this. our limit of disturbance looks like. Um, I just want everybody here to kind of situate the site, know where it sits vis-a-vis -vis the neighbors. So, can everybody see? 
So highlighted in green here is basically the two arrays, right, and the accents row and Florence row, okay? Right here. That's the construction laydown, Lathrop Retirement Community right here. And down here we have the houses on Maxine Circle. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense for everybody? Yep. Okay, great. So we had questions about the polls. I just want to start by showing you, and again, we had a very tight deadline for the renderings, so we, sh we mapped everything in a 3D model. I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we do this. Um, but we didn't map the foreground just to show you what the poles on the axis look like, okay? So we have the 3D model that we put together using a computer program called InfraWorks. And it gives us all the cover and topography surrounding our site. So we can look at the elevations, we can see which people are gonna have more visibility versus less. And then we focus on those areas to give you what you're seeing now, which are visual renderings, okay? And our initial run, we identified <coughs> three regions that we wanted to show you. So this is the first one. This is access on Florence Road. Again, here is the heritage farm. We did not map the horses, but they're there. And those are the poles, okay? So is this showing the entrance? This is the road into the site that we're looking exactly. at there? This okay. is the existing access that you see right yep. here. Okay. okay. Here are the buildings on Bernie Gall's property currently. And then beyond that, you see the tree line here. There's later. Okay. Does anybody have any questions on this one? No. And what are those poles connected to? So those poles, so this is an existing pole along the road. We have three poles for the utility. It's for security purposes and three poles for us. So six poles total. Those are the poles that are basically taking the energy out of the system into the electric grid. Okay. Well, well hold on, hold on. We're gonna, we're gonna do questions. Let them finish, okay? Thanks. Okay. So then the second area there's a lot to deal with here. <laughs> okay. Let's start with later. So this is a view from Maxine Circle. <laughs> Uh, sorry. <laughs> Maxine is on my mind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this is later, okay? The two houses are like at the end of the circle. The array, and you don't you don't see it here clearly, so it is behind that tree line. Behind mm -hmm. the tree line. So behind the people the who own those homes, they look out their back windows, they're taking breakfast, the birds and the bird feeder, they see tree line, not solar array. Yeah, yeah. How about how about when there's no leaves on those trees? So again, there's two things. Great question. Two things. This is from the circle. This is not from their backyard. Right. Yeah. We didn't go in there and take pictures, right? Yep. This is from the circle. During the winter, we walk the site, and that vegetative buffer is pretty thick. It's not just one line of trees. It's a lot of trees. So that's one thing. The second thing is the array is not actually here. This is the access road. Uh -huh. As you can see, there's a long, mm -hmm. if you zoom out a little bit, go up north, there's a long access way where there's no panels at all, right? Yeah. Lathrop is just to the north there. So like the array is actually in the back there. So roughly speaking, when we're looking here, where, where, is, where are we looking in that? So this is... Uh, is it as far down as the laydown area, or is it still closer to the road? Max, uh, Lathrop is right around here, right? Okay. You're looking at the tree cover that's here, and the two houses around here. Okay. And it's so yeah, roughly. Yeah, roughly. Yeah, yeah. roughly. Okay. The okay. array is here in relation to the houses. Okay. But, but also in line with the laydown area, so it may not be a situation where the array is an issue, but maybe during construction there's some screening issues. There's, that may be a little closer to them. Right. I okay. think that even... Okay. Yeah, I mean, we'll, I think we're probably going to have to do a site visit. We're gonna, we'll oh, we'll dig sure, into this, but sure. I, I, yeah. that, I just want to try to think about what for sure. issues yeah. there may be. The tree cover there, again, is, is pretty thick. Okay. Yeah. That's definitely one of my questions, is what you just alluded to, is during construction, whether that tree cover will provide enough protection, not just visual, but also auto, audible protection, so that they're not listening to construction and all right. that. Right. That's, that's a very good point. And I believe 
when we met with the community, they told us that there's already some noise mm -hmm. going on due to the activities of the current landowner there. Um, what we're doing is a lot further down. So yes, they might hear trucks going right. by, they might hear cars, they might hear a little bit of noise during those 12 or 14 weeks, and I apologize for that, if like for the construction, but I don't think it's gonna be that important. Okay, so we'll, we can look into that, but that's, yeah, no, no, that's good. And I think, yeah. I think what would be helpful, because I think this is everyone's first time seeing the visualization, so mm -hmm. um, the first map that you had that showed the, the limit of work, I think having a key showing where you're taking the fixtures from, would be helpful moving forward. Oh, that's a good idea. Um, yeah. So, so uh, idea. to pinpoint where you are in Lathrop, that yeah, so like a key map. Like okay, so you can actually see the circle up there at the top. Yep. Yeah, that's Lathrop right there. We're shooting right between the, those residences, right? Yep. Got it. Okay, very helpful. And there's one visualization I'm just dying to see. It's the <clears throat> it's the big you know the Bigfoot. What do the panels look like? <laughs> but we'll get to it. It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> Okay. I think so, yeah. So this is the view pretty much. We, we got out of the car and we were at the circle here and we took a picture looking at the array directly. Okay. okay. And we tried to go into the gap. There's a gap between those two houses to, to show like maximum visibility. Yep. We didn't go on your porch. <laughs> well, it's, that's not Dog wouldn't let you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we know. <laughs> All right, so this the array is here, can everybody, I mean, it's kind of, it's small, we can pass this around if you want, but the array is here in the back. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And this is the fence. And everybody, it's tough, I know, but the fence is right here, and we're basically showing the vegetative buffer here at planting. So this is like six to seven feet tall at planting. Okay. Okay. And uh, I have to admit, I didn't peruse that section of your plantings there, but what uh, what kind of trees and how tall are you intending those to get yep. over time? I'm get to that in a okay. <laughs> so this is a mix in the, the trees. It's a mix of juniper and red cedar. So we're going to juxtapose juniper has a maximum height of like about 15 feet. Okay. okay. And red cedar can go a lot higher, like up to 50 feet. Are you okay. worried that that'll create shadows for your array? No, because it's it's further out. Like we have already like a shade buffer that's included after, just after the array and before limit of disturbance mm -hmm. to prevent any, any of that from happening. What is your shade buffer on feet? How big is our shade buffer? It, it depends like from one Darius. area to another. Yeah. It depends which way you're going and how big those trees are. Okay. So when you said you identified the three problem areas for for viewing and sort of uh, screening, you're talking about Maxine Circle, Lathrop, and then where the road meets Florence Road? Yeah. Those In are the three areas? Yeah. Okay. We drove around the site. We did a viewshed analysis on a computer and saw the elevations. And also, we had an initial meeting with Jeff. Um, and we talked about the initial locations that, you know, the town might okay. want to see initially. Yeah. Okay. So th this is at training. So six to seven feet. You can see there's some visibility of the array, mm -hmm. obviously. Um, that's, that's a big visibility. I looked at it. Yeah. No. I, I just have, okay. That's only part. Yeah. So we're gonna we're this is the very tip of the iceberg on our in sure. investigation. So it's not addressing I the whole thing. I promise we're gonna. Okay. We're going to talk more about that view than anybody wants to hear us talk about that view, I promise. It won't be tonight. Okay, because it's, it's much bigger. All right. Yeah. Yeah, it's but let's, let's let them finish the presentation, and then we'll get into that stuff. All right. All right, Nico. Okay, great. So this is six to eight feet, right? Okay. Now I'm going to show you five years in and then ten years in. Okay. okay. 
but what do you do until that time? Just stop over the view. Yeah. Well, you sir, there, sir, do. sir, sir, please, please wait. We will give you a chance, I promise. I just want to get this through and then we can have public comment. Okay. So, this is at five years, okay? So, significantly less visibility. And again, we're showing a gap in the, so there's existing tree cover. We're showing the vegetative buffer, and it's shown on the plan on the civil set. The last page of the civil set has the landscaping plan. Mm -hmm. You can see where we're proposing those trees, right? So this is 15 to 17 feet already of tree height, okay? Five years in. So the views are, are starting to get really mitigated here. You want to see? Can everybody see? More or less? Okay, and then 10 years in, the final rendering. Here. Okay. There's about shading, so the project faces south. Yeah. There's trees around the east side, Got so it. the shading isn't that big of an issue, even at maturity. Okay. Okay, so that here we're on significant height, like this is about 20 to 22 feet. Okay. Okay, and it can grow taller than that obviously but we didn't go beyond. Is there concern with any of the with the two trees you were talking about that when they get to a certain height then they won't block the actual view of the array because all of the branches will be up higher or is there are, is it a mix that'll stay down low? And it's, I mean if you you said some of them are growing up to 50 feet right? Yeah. So if you have a 50 foot tree where the branches aren't starting at the bottom will, are these plants that are trees that are going to plant and then grow and and eventually not shield at the bottom? That's a great question. That's why we did a mix of junipers in front. They're thick, bushy trees. And then in the back, red cedars okay. that we're going to cover. Yeah. I would like to see if you could point out on the map where the, those trees are. Can you show me where those trees are on the map? <coughs> sure. Where are we if you don't mind going to the last page. Very last page. Okay, perfect. There it is. I admit I skimmed one page and this was it. Okay, so while we put it up on the screen, just for information, Vegetative buffer is going to be right here. Um, it's kind of tough to see, but there are wetlands here that we're staying away from, and there is existing trees within those wetlands that are covering like, all the rest of Maxine. So it's literally, from our view, it's two houses that have that exposure that we tried to focus on on the rendering. Yes, exactly. That's where it is. Okay. Great. So you see the the red cedar in the back. And then the junipers are like in between the trunks. And so on the Lathrop side, you don't think that you need to add a vegetative buffer because the existing vegetation you believe will cover it? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. All right, sure. Yeah. Um, anything else you want to add before we open this up? That's all right. Me. Thank, Thank you. you very much. All right, so this is not all going to get done tonight, no matter what happens. <laughs> so. Yeah, everyone will have a chance to speak. I want you to feel free to. We're going to schedule a site visit, I think, so that we can go out and not only see the site, but also hopefully take a look from backyards so we're not looking at renderings. We can see what it actually looks like. Um, so that being said... Before you... Well, oh, sorry. Just, I know I really want to hear what people have to say, too, but there's one piece that's just absolutely missing for me. I, I, I've seen the documents here, but we don't know what these solar panels are like. I've read that they turn to follow the sun? How tall are they? How high off the ground are they? At yep. what angle are they? What do they look like? Absolutely. That's a great question. Um, so the panels that we're proposing to install on this site are fixed tilt panels as opposed to trackers. The reason why we decided to do that is, as some of you might know, trackers are better in terms of yield and production. They follow, they track the sun during the day. Um, we did not, we, even though initially we wanted to go with trackers, we decided to move to fixed tilt because it reduced the grading on site and tree clearing and impact on the buffers from about 80%. So we went with fixed tilt design. Um, they're about eight foot tall and they do not move, right? 
Are they on a single pole that you drive into the ground? Single pile. Each yeah. one. And yeah. what's the distance between each one? Oh, that varies as well, depending on the site design. So yeah. this looks like it's got a max height of 12 feet. Is that when they get tilted that they go, are they set at eight? The, and tip, they, the tip of it is at 12 feet. Okay, yeah. so eight is where you're setting the pole, and then when it tilts up, it can go up to four feet higher. Okay. All right, good question. Sorry about that. Question on this wall. So on the screen, we have up the, the, neck, the uh, inverter view. So it shows what would look like it's on a foundation or a platform with the transformer and inverter shown, but does this does this cover the the storage box that you guys were referring to before? Is that yeah. is so to depict that? Yeah, great question. So this is a concrete <coughs> pad and there's the inverter, the transformer, and the battery energy storage system. And where's the battery energy storage system? It's not shown on here. Okay. I think I think uh, if I may on, on behalf of the board, I think requesting some additional information about what these actually look like. Yep. Because um, the inverter, there's nothing that kind of a white box. That I don't think it's sufficient for the to understand what that inverter will look like in the battery storage. Sure. Think, if you if you've installed any of these anywhere else, I think some photographs of what they look like would be. Yeah, helpful. we can send you photographs and spec sheets as well. Yep, that'd be great. The manufacturer. Yep. And um, so the the pad for the for the transformer and inverters is a concrete pad. Correct. Okay. And how about? Um, where the panels are put up. Is that going into concrete or does that go right into the ground? No, right into the ground. Okay. Yeah. And um, I think we'll probably hold off on the decommissioning stuff, but is that, that those are relatively easy to then remove from the ground, the poles? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, if they're driven in piles, not ballast. Yep. Yeah. All right. Anybody else from the board have any comments or questions before we open this up? No. Okay. For you, sir. Uh, please come oh. right. It's something you just mentioned. That yeah, he, come on up. He's let's, picking you. Let's get you on the record. You got your chance. <laughs> Nico, you can sit down. Thank you. We'll, we'll, we might make you come back up to answer some questions, please. You <laughs> caught my ear. The decommissioning, that would be after, that was one of my questions. Yeah, so that's that's one of the things that's, that is in the application, we're going to have to get into that, but but the bylaws require that there be a plan for what's going to happen when this shuts down and that there be a financial surety, so basically money set aside because ideally when this shuts down, you know, they take everything out and either put in new stuff or move on somewhere else, but there's also the scenario where we look around and Beacon Solar is nowhere to be found, and so we make sure we, the, the city doesn't want to have to fund that. We don't really want to have to do it at all, but we certainly don't want to have to pay for it. We'll go into detail on that. Ten for <laughs> Promise. Thank you. All right. That's Anybody? standard for us, too. Yeah, I mean, that's industry practice. That's not unique here. Um, okay, so anybody, comments, questions? Can we address hazards? Please, please, can you come? I'm sorry. <laughs> name and address, please. Somebody address the hazards. I mean, can you just give your name and address for the record so we Patty can? Patty Cavalli, 10 Maxine Circle, in the line of fire. Um, the hazards. You know, do I have to worry about my family? It's power. It's... There's power lines that I didn't know were going to be there. I've read that these um, panels give off silicone dust if they're broken. That can cause lung cancer. I've got grandchildren. You know, I, I want to know the bad side. You're telling us all the good side. Tell us the bad side. Great. You can come up now, Nico. Please. Sure. So thanks for bringing those points up. Um, the first thing that I'm going to say is whenever we design those sites, we think about all of this. Um, and solar is not a new technology. It's been here for a while. Relatively new. And there hasn't been any major issues of leakage, um, issues with power lines. It's just like anything else, you know. It could be struck by lightning, mm -hmm. and the, the site could take fire. Yes, it's true. Uh, but we have emergency response plans for that. Uh, we try to mitigate those as much as possible. Um, battery pads also are a big issue um, that are raised. Like it, questions come up a lot about battery pads. Um, Nico, yeah, from the go. <laughs> uh, a little louder. Is is it not loud enough <laughs> still? Okay, I'm sorry. Um, speaking just to you, I should speak to the audience. Yeah, um, yeah. Battery pads also. Um, we have safety teams that do operation and maintenance plans and safety plans for those for that equipment. And you know, it's in our 
it's our intention to make maintain those you know equip that equipment and that system running as much as possible um, so we do not want a hazard on site we do everything that we can to prevent that because not only does it harm the community if it happens but also it harms us and the industry as a whole so so, so let's go through the for the two arrays and the areas that are most closely abutted by residences let's look at the two things you mentioned so one the transformer inverters we talked a little bit before I think Brad mentioned that they're sort of on the inside located to the center of the lot so that how far is the for say the one that is closest to Maxine Circle how far is that inverter transformer from the property line down there do you have a, a rough idea on the top of my mind no but the distance that you see here is pretty consequent like we know that we have a 50 foot buffer from that wetland Yep. So I'm assuming that that's at least like seven or eight times that. Um, okay. I can give you a, a definite number. But I think that would be a helpful the number. The scale to of this plan is one inch equals 150 feet. Okay. So if you look from there to there, what is that? Exactly. Maybe six, six inches. inches. Six inches. So it'd be six times 150. 900. I think, and maybe Jesse was about to say this, forgive me, but I, I think it would be highly advisable to um, have a conversation with the neighbors. Uh, you know, introduce yourselves after this meeting, and then come to next meeting trying to do your best to address their very specific concerns, including dust from the panel and anything else they might have. You know, we've sat through a few of these, and we've heard some things from neighbors that were terrible concerns. We've seen responses and gone through a lot of reports. We have a lot of information that you don't necessarily have, but it's really on you guys to provide the information that they're requesting. And we look at that really to make sure that you guys understand what you're doing. So I'm, I'm looking for you to present good solid answers to the silicon dust, to, to you know, just power lines and all those kinds of things and, and really in depth answer the question for the, the neighbors at the next meeting. Absolutely, yeah, yep. we can do that. And so then the other thing that you mentioned was the power line. So I, I just want to clarify, so that the, the, all the transmission lines within that array will be underground, correct? Within the, array, within the within, within the, the, the field, line. yeah, Correct. of the one by Maxine Circle, and then the poles will start as it leaves there by the transformer and goes across the road, right? Okay, so there, yeah. there won't be transmission lines or poles on that section closer to oh, Maxine yeah. Circle, yeah. right? Okay. But I, I do want to point out that these yep. are the exact same poles. They probably run along They'll Florence Road on the front. To your house sure. No right, but so, but, but anyway. Underground. Underground. Great. So right. those, those poles, it's the exact same poles that you have on any street. And we have a lot of those, right? Just, just wanted to point that out. Okay. Jeff? Just, I think um, as, as you take uh, members Arvis's recommendations to, to address some of the concerns you've heard, I know that the fire department has not issued any formal review, but I think that in at least an email, the, the, the city, the chief of the fire department has not seen battery storage yet. Uh, we, we don't currently have any facilities with battery storage. So I think that there's going to be some, um, in, it's going to be important to speak directly with the fire department and make sure that they understand the components of the battery storage. And, what, and be able to report that, that to us too. Right, what yeah. if anything that means for their responses. Um, I think it would also be good to just have confirmation from them in writing that they're comfortable, you know, getting vehicles to the end of the road so it's a longer internal road so just making sure that they're comfortable with that i have heard them say in other cases that they you know they may not venture in there or they can't turn around right. or things like that so yeah. i make sure we have clarification from them that that's not an issue right. sure gary where does your hookup uh when all that power comes off of that solar array where does that hook up on florence does that come up on florence road or it hooks up to the main uh, main circuit or whatever it is our connection, interconnection to yeah. the grid. Where, where, yeah. Does all that power come up on the Florence Road when it's all uh, right, here. Yeah. right there? Yeah. This is That's the very first rendering that I showed. You yeah. six poles. And so then from there, it runs on existing poles? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Other comments? Come on down. My name's Dan Moylan, 43 Florence Road, East Hampton. I may have missed this, but I'm just curious if you could describe what the view will be as you turn onto Florence Road from Route 10 and you're driving towards Northampton. As far as I can tell, the only 
change in view will be a, a gravel road and the new utility poles along that road, but will there be any visibility of the solar panels at all, at all as you drive down that road? That's Florence Road re you're referring to? Yes. Yeah. Great question. I'm just going to pull up the rendering for you to see. we're going to want a site visit and that'll be one of the things that we'll keep our eyes on we'll take a, a stand at that spot and uh, usually not always but we can discuss it those site visits you can invite the public yeah. I don't know, so other people could attend to, to see it themselves um, and we'll keep an eye on that for what it's worth I did some photographs earlier it's a pretty busy road folks are usually driving pretty quickly in that spot so for safety we'll be careful there but yep. it also means it's a pretty fleeting view to that corridor. Fair point. Yeah, just a, I guess a quick cl uh, clarification question about 43 Florence Road is is your is the question that you might view it from a residence on Florence Road or just just in drive by you know as as you're traversing Florence Road uh, where is 43 relative to the map generally is that something that is uh, are you answer your question yes <laughs> uh, from residence view or down um, okay. I'm we're right, those like long little crosses right in the middle across from the horse field. So okay. So in between Maxine Circle and the entrance and the access road. Okay. I think that just gives the board a little bit more focus on that that stretch yep. there, basically across from Heritage. So Farm. that so that view, the rendering there of the street is is not just the view that, you know, you're going to see as you drive by, but that's the view from your front yard across Florence Road, more or less. Yeah. Okay. That's worth keeping in mind. Thank you. Going to make you come up here, sorry. Uh, get your steps in. <laughs> I'm Jody Fern, and I live at 41 Florence Road, so I echo Dan's concerns about what I'm looking out at. And I also have a question about maintenance of the solar fields. Um, is there grass? How is that cut, if it's cut? Or are pesticides used to keep um, any weeds down just because it all it is all wetlands and I know my backyard is a wetland so I'm just curious on the maintenance of the field great question mm -hmm. yeah you can answer yeah thank you that's a great question um, so we plant vegetation under the panels um, as soon as we're done with them and they're maintained uh, by our operation and maintenance teams um, the grass is mowed, and no pesticides are used. We don't use pesticides. What about, I know sometimes there's some issues with whatever's used sometimes to clean the panels. Is that a natural biodegradable material, or is yes. that sometimes? Yes, yes. We okay. always use EPA-approved biodegradable And how um, regularly does that get done? Oh, that's a tough question. It depends on the surrounding area, the dust cover, um, you know, we look at that further down the line. Okay. I can provide that to you. Okay, okay. that would be helpful. The name of the product that's used for the cleaning would be nice to know. Yeah, that would be helpful too. Right. Thank you. Good idea, Jessica. Other comments or questions tonight? Please. Oh, you got you got cut. She's going first. I saw her first. Sorry. <laughs> I, I promised you your time. <laughs> Deborah Ock asked a 21 growth plan. Um, my question is, we're in the southern section. I know the array is in the northern, but 
if you went through Maxine Circle, through the woods and around, we're here, we're right up against wetlands. And um, we have a huge amount of animals, large predators. We have about nine bears right now. And is during the um, building of it, uh, the sound, the noise, the people, the trucks. Is this going to be driving all the animals down into the southern area where we are? Like, is, is everything you're going to be doing just driving the animals in a whole different area? And um, after it's built, what are the test balls for the animals, for us? Because we can hear if there's trucks and things <coughs> going on there. I can hear it in my backyard. There's, um, you know, reverberations and sound. So I just wanted to know how it impacts everything. I know I'm in a whole other area, but if you drove Florence Road, you come to the satellite, you take a right. We're right past Tasty Tap. And then if you go down Grove, and we're right up again. So if you went through the woods, I'm right there. Do you have any experience with that? I realize that gets into a totally different. Yeah, it's just, but uh, no, I think it's. A, I think it's a fair question. I mean, it, we talked a little bit about the wildlife corridors, um, but I, I think that you know it's there's two large fields here that are going to be displaced, and I mean it seems logical that animals certainly during construction will move around, but I, I don't know that I can ask you that question. It but seems like I mean, it might be out of your range. Why can't you give an example? At 10 o'clock this morning, I had a police car in my driveway. And he was guiding a mother bear who had been roaming all the neighborhoods who came up my driveway and then through the woods. Yeah. So they do a circle, but they also come out of the woods and through the neighborhood. So right. I just I just didn't know if that impact was gonna start pushing the animals into a whole different area. Yep. Yeah. Maybe maybe we can do a little research on that yeah. before our so next I definitely I, I don't have an answer to that. Bear. I'm sure nobody and really knows. Life, but you did bring up a good point, which is noise levels after construction. Um, and, and after it's built, the decibels. Right, right. No, yeah, yeah, exactly. So the array emits that you will. You should come up hear. and speak so the okay. home audience oh, can see it. It's recording. We have thousands right. watching. Yeah. <laughs> Followers. <laughs> okay, so the noise levels, uh, that's a very good question that comes up a lot. Um, I'm happy to say that there will be less noise than there is right now. Um, solar panels do not emit any sound. Um, what emits sound though is the inverters and the transformers during normal operation from say 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. That's like peak production. Um, but the sound that's emitted is like 30 to 50 decibels. Um, and just to give you some insight, that is inaudible beyond 150 feet. Uh, that's basically the sound of it. <laughs> <laughs> Am I also inaudible? <laughs> no, I can't hear a lot of things. <laughs> so, that's, that's going to be an issue. Hold well, you have it Hold in on. a shed, is that correct? Pardon? It's, it's at that decibel level, but you've got it in a shed. Yes. Which is further going to deaden the sound. Right, so what, what I'm saying is the noise that comes out of the inverters and the transformers is 30 to 50 decibels maximum. That is with the shell. Keep in mind that is 30, 40 decibels, 150 feet away from the inverters. That is the sound of a normal conversation, lower than what I'm speaking now. <laughs> it is right? yeah. Just for your information. So a landmower, for example, is 130 decibels. A truck, even more, right? So don't worry about the noise. Quiet, silent neighbors. Okay, so. After, after, after construction, yeah. There will be an increase in noise during the 12 to 16 weeks. Yes, that is true. Right. E yep. You said it will be more quiet. Right, I was going to ask that. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm guessing, and I hesitate to put words in your mouth because I really want to put you on the spot. But, <laughs> but my only thought in that how that could possibly be is that the solar panels are blocking sound. Are they obstructing it? I know these inverters are making sound and you have them in the shed and they're generating it. But why would it be more quiet than it is currently? It is the only reason why it's more quiet than it is quietly, qu uh, more quiet than it is currently, is because the landowner and his family are doing work on site, I operating see. trucks, okay. hearing trees, etc. 
Um, so all of that we believe is, is going to be reduced significantly okay. once the panels are in. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yes, sir. Your moment of glory. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Mark Cavalli and I live at 10 Maxine Circle. I actually have two questions. Um, seeing as how you have the panels here, and I live here, and it's all downhill, where's all that water going? Right into my backyard or basement? One. And two, if the company should go out of business three or four years after this is built, who's going to take responsibility for maintaining it, fixing the problems, and Disposing of it of the of the equipment that's damaged is that going to be the town, or is it just going to lay there in a tangled mess? Great. Yep. Back to the stand. <laughs> Thanks for your question. Um, I think it's divided in two parts. The the first one is erosion. Water in my backyard. Water. So stormwater runoff. Right. Right. So I believe we've addressed this before, but uh, you didn't answer the question. Well, no. What we addressed was that there, the the CONCOM is dealing with that. The Conservation Commission is going to review that entire plan, and they, they haven't. I don't know. Have you submitted your stormwater plan? Did you say already? Correct. Okay. So the Conservation Commission will do an in-depth analysis of that. They will either approve the plan or require certain other steps. That will come to us and will be part of our final determination. So we, we haven't looked at the stormwater plan at this point, you're right, but we have discussed the process. So I, I think that this has clearly been identified as an issue. I think it's an existing issue. What the impact of this project will be on that, whether there's mitigation that can be required. Conservation Commission will look at that first, and then based on what they do, it'll come to us, and we'll be able to take a second dive into that. So I think to the extent if you got notice for the Conservation Commission hearing, or even if you didn't, you probably want to go to that. When was that meeting, Jeff? I believe it was advertised for June 24th. Okay. So that would be worth going to and providing input there. Um, and I mean, they'll, they'll look at that whether you're there or not, but it certainly would be helpful for them to have you there to talk about that. And your second question is basically the same answer. The decommissioning is something we've yet to go through on this board. It'll probably come up at our next meeting and maybe the one after, depending on how long this process goes. And we will get in depth in it. But, but that is a fair question. So that's what I was mentioning before when this gentleman asked, is that there's, there's not only a plan for when this when they have to decommission so it's generally based on if either they decide to shut down or if it stops you know producing power i think their plan says for 12 months um then it kicks in and they will be obligated to remove everything basically to the condition it is in now more or less okay, and still in right right so then so then option number two they also in con in connection with that when we get a uh estimate for a conservative estimate for what the cost is going to be in the city's favor um, they're required to provide a surety, so they're required in a number of ways, either a letter of credit or actually escrowing money in a certain amount, so that in that scenario where you look around and Beacon Solar is gone, the city at least has the funds already set aside, provided by Beacon Solar, so that while the city has to deal with the headache of that, they wouldn't have to pay for the, for the decommissioning themselves. So that's a process we go through. It's, it's required in, I, I'm sure, almost every city in town that deals with this has decommissioning. You guarantee that if the company's out of business? Because the, the money, we, we take the money day one. Yeah. So, the, so, the, so in, in other projects that we've approved, if we look at this and we say, okay, we think it's going to be $100,000 to decommission this project, we're allowed to go up to 125% by our bylaws, so we'll say we're going to require $125,000 either in an account that we control or with a line of credit or something that's already approved that we can attach that money and we can get it, the town or the city doing that. And so that money is there. So in the, in the unfortunate scenario where they're gone and this is sitting in your backyard, at least the city has the funds necessary to cover the decommissioning. And we'll go through a detailed process as to what that decommissioning is that includes interest, labor rates, right. all the equipment. We're going to go through a, a very detailed process that will answer all those questions. Yeah. Who maintains it up until the time it's going to decommissioned? Let's say if you have a half dozen broken panels due to a hurricane or a straight line wind or whatever the case, and we have all this debris and 
being dumped into the wet wetland. Okay, who's going to pick pick that up? There, there, that's what the money is set aside for, so the city can decommission that project. Light. Yeah. You don't wait. Six well, there, there's a built-in delay. There's a built-in delay. So, the, and there's also maintenance obligations under the special permit that they're required to maintain this project and the property to that level. And as long as they're in business. It, right. So, 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 yeah. Right. And if they're not, then the city has the funds to handle it themselves if they go out of business. We should move on. Yeah. We'll we'll get into that in depth. I promise. But that's generally the structure for it. One thing that I would like to add. Yep. Um, we have projects all across the country, and we have projects in North Carolina that went through the hurricane, and we are on site as soon as possible because this is not only to the town but to us too, like our most valuable asset, and it's our interest to have those maintained and working as long as possible. As long as you're in business. In the event that, Sir, we, in, the event, let me, in the event that we go out of business, this form will be the first thing that we look at to see how we can either decommission it or sell it to someone else because it's it's an asset. It's not something that we would want to see abandoned ever. Anybody else tonight? There will be future opportunities. You want to? Yeah. Yep. Um, all right. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you said that you all said there will be additional meetings because yes. I, I will be better prepared with better questions. Right. Then. Okay. D do you have a plan as far as when that will be? We're going to talk about that right now. I think as soon as All you're right. done, I think it looks like we've, we've reached a good turning point here to address okay. a site visit and a subsequent meeting. I don't want to belabor things. I was just curious because I will be better prepared with Excellent. You will definitely have another opportunity. Okay. Thank okay. You. Um, can you make your way up to the microphone, sir? Thank you. <laughs> I live in Southampton. Uh, th you're taking down a farmhouse up there, a white farmhouse. On that, there's a white farmhouse there. No, you aren't. That stays there. Is the road on the left of the farmhouse or the right of the farmhouse? No. It's on this side of the farmhouse. Correct. Okay. Uh, in prepping that property, they went in in about 2015 and took down the two bulkheads of the culvert on Northampton Street. There used to be a pipe that, there's a large pipe down there about five feet, and there was a pipe in the center of that, I'm guessing 10 inches or a foot, and that drained the property up there. So they took down the two bulkheads, ripped out the pipe. So the original was about a four or five foot pipe. So that dropped the water table in that whole area two and a half feet, which affects our land on Northampton Street. They also deteriorated the quality of the culvert where it's going to fail. Uh, whether it was Mother Earth or God or a beaver, they're digging in around the sides of the culvert. I went over to the DOT in, up in Hatfield and I told them, I said it was there. I heard them jackhammers and stuff, jackhammering it out. I went and told them. I said there was, you know, told them the story I told you. They said, we'll check it out, but they didn't care. So now when they deteriorate that culvert, they did the same thing up on South Main Street. When they deteriorate the culvert, the town's going to have to pay to fix it. And when they fix it, they got to widen it, put in a bike trail, which would make it nice for everybody else, but they're going to take some more land from people. So. I'm curious why when you put in a housing development, you have to build a drainage pond for the water to go, you know, dissipate over a period of time and not just run off. And that you don't have to do this for this, and this will have more water than a housing development. Well, the stormwater plan is what we've been talking about. The Conservation Commission is going to take a look at that. But I will say that it, generally the solar plans are they don't increase permeable material because it, there's a level up above and below all of the panels is the grass and the dirt that still infiltrates the water. Yeah. So in general, a solar panel itself doesn't create impermeable material, so impervious surface. Okay. So it, it, okay. it, it's not the same as paving a parking lot. So it, it doesn't mean you can't have that where you, you know, in this case, they're not putting in a paved road, for example. That would create more 
impervious surface. But so in general, it doesn't create the same sort of issues with that. But I think any issues with culverts, any issues with drainage, all of that should be addressed by the Conservation Commission through the stormwater plan. And I would encourage you to go to that hearing and talk to them about this. Yeah. I also think with respect to the culverts, they're talking about replacing all the culverts, so um, or five of them. So that may solve some of the issue with you know deterioration of an existing culvert. They had a meeting, the mayor had a meeting, meet and greet of the people when she came into office. I went to the meeting, there were no chairs there. So I sat by the window and listened. I caught Joe McCoy on the way out. And they've been fracking up there. They ran a compressor for four days. It was still running on Monday morning at 7 o'clock. I went and got a coffee. It was gone at 8 o'clock, 8.30 in the morning. So they're pumping something there to dry out the land. So that should be looked into. Joe buried it, you know, which is okay, I guess. I don't know. I mean, that's, I mean, that's not part of the project that's in front of us. So, I mean, that, I, I don't know who to send you to for that, but. Building you know, inspector. It's not us. They were pumping something in the ground. Environmental police? We're not a. Thank you. All right, thank you, sir. <laughs> um, okay, so I think we need to obviously continue this, but also schedule a site visit. Definitely. Did you have something, Jim? No, I, I'm right there with you. I was going to look at Jeff and say when. What do we got coming up? Um, the way that we usually start the discussion would be to potentially talk about the next meeting um, and the, the schedule for July, and then potentially try to pick a day for a site visit. Um, yep. The planning board schedule shifted slightly. The, originally there was a meeting um, set for July 2nd, but I think based on consensus by email for scheduling purposes, that got moved to July 9th is the next, yep. the next that's the next planning board meeting followed by um, another meeting on July 16th. What's on our docket for the 9th? Um, as of right now, you have one application that met the submission deadline for July 9th. Um, so there's there's a potential scenario where you move this to July 16th, where in theory this would be the, the sole item to. There's to nothing do. on for the 16th right now. Um, no. Okay. I guess there is still a chance that with the application deadline that you could get another application yep. to position itself for the 16th. I, I would say it's <laughs> we're in sort of a tighter window for site visits. I think it makes sense to move it to the 16th so we can try to have time to find a date that works for a site visit. Does that totally work? reasonable, Harry? Does that make sense to you? Does the sixteenth work for you all in terms of time to do the things we asked, speak with the neighbors, come up with some additional answers? Okay. Okay. Um, all right. So I guess first I'll take a motion to continue the hearing. To I motion to continue the hearing uh, for Beacon Solar LLC special permit till the sixteenth of uh, July. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. So then, site visit. Um, and Did you need a specific time? Did you want to set a specific time? Did there? you say six? Yes, I yeah. said six. Six. <laughs> six would be the start time for the um, six on the 16th of July. Sorry. OK, no, no, that's all right. All right, so then um, we should think about a site visit when, I mean, how, are you folks flexible as far as giving us access and being able to be there? What's your schedule like? Yeah, if you let us know ahead of time. OK. And it makes sense uh, to do more than one or a couple different groups depending on right. I mean, works. what I'm thinking is if we can try to coordinate um, at least a site visit and then maybe also a visit over to Maxine Circle on that side to look from your backyard so we can see from there um, what would happen, and then possibly Lathrop on that side too. Um, I don't know that we can't do all of those in one day, but it's, it's, day. it's a lot to do. So, <laughs> sounds fun. Um, uh, that's been the pattern that's worked before understanding that on Maxine Circle ideally you know the the people who live at 10 would grant permission to view the from the back area yeah okay and then well I mean it's it's been helpful in the past if you can be there because I think that it when we've been able to walk these abutting properties with both the applicant and the residents and talk about specific concerns it, it helps the whole process so I think it'd be great if you guys could be there which is why I want to schedule that with you. I'm not sure if any of the Lathrop people are still here. I think they just left. Do we put but. out notice when we do these things? <laughs> if if the bo so if the board does not firm up a time or a day right now, then what I would do is coordinate with a few of the people, and then we we could post a meeting of the planning board, which would be 48 hours public notice, 
I have to post an agenda. Um, or we could try to set something now so that other people... Right, well, and I think, it, I mean, maybe it makes sense. I think doing the site and Maxine Circle, we can do it once, and then maybe... Next Wednesday night, 5.30. Boom. You're just throwing something Mike. out there. Uh, we can't do next week. I won't, I won't okay. be around. Never mind. But, all right, it was worth a try. How about the, the Wednesday, at, well... Right. How I about think. Tuesday, July 2nd? Uh-uh. I think no. that's a tough week. I know. Months. That's yeah. a hard week. I'd rather do it. Uh, well, we're good. How, how about the 10th? It's a Wednesday. 10th works. Works for me. Yep. How about uh, that? 10th is potentially a little bit problematic, just depending on the time that you're going to talk. There's a city council meeting on the 10th. Okay. Tonight that I know that I think I'm obligated to be. Okay. On. Are you are you going to advertise for this site visit or is so it just going to be? You? If we can pick the date now, we can announce it. You said something about doing 48 hours potentially, but if we pick the site now, then people here can kind of. Yeah, I mean, it, it generally we we try to do these with members of the public who come with us. Okay. It's important to know that we can't deliberate while we're there, so we can ask specific questions. We can hear your concerns, but we can't really talk so so you know right. we're under certain rules because we can only talk during our hearings here otherwise it's inappropriate so just keep that in mind so but so yes yeah, so, I mean what we ideally would do is you would be allowing us on there but also any group of people that came with us okay. yeah okay that might be bullish but how about tomorrow oh boy that's actually uh, good for me I can't do tomorrow <sighs> that was so close <laughs> uh, next week after Hong Kong Next week is bad for Jeff. How about just th this Thursday, the 20th? Weekend? You do Thursday, the 20th works for me. This Thursday? What are, what are we talking about here? Six o'clock? 5.36. I think six is probably easiest to get over there. I think we lock Thursday and six o'clock. Let's I make that make happen. It. You can't make it? I got a CPA meeting. Killing me here. <laughs> Jeff, you're out all next week? You're dealing with like yeah. the most busy people in the community. So um, it's definitely hurting cats. How about l like uh, this Saturday morning? Uh, no. <laughs> See, that's great Saturday morning. We may need to take a couple bites of the apple. How about July 1st? It's a Monday. I know it's the week of July 4th. I but can't, it's but you can represent for me. July 8th? Wait, it's a Monday? Yeah. July 1st? I take it back. No, I'm here for that. Monday, July 1st. Harry? Yeah. Beacon folks or Cypress folks? July July first. I know that's that's like a holiday week, but it's really early in the week. <laughs> no, that, that works for me. Great. All right. Mm -hmm. So we will plan on uh, where's the best place to meet on the site. Lawrence Road. Right, right at the entrance. Yeah. You can park at Harvard Farm if you want. That might be good. Okay. Depending on how many people we have, it's, uh, it's a busy and kind of a blind spot if you're all. Okay. You can park inside. What is that access road? Is that access road uh, Any park accessible? Access. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I would prefer to at least park there, and, and maybe we can talk about if there's Offered. some yep. visual um, aids from, from Heritage Farm. We could work on that. If any of you know any of the residents in the area that have left and you know want to spread the word, that sure couldn't hurt. Um, Right, okay, so we'll plan on meeting there at the entrance at 6, and then going from there, hopefully, to your backyard. I think what I would guess is that I did have a communication with the applicant that from the access road at Florence Road, you can, wa you can walk basically the outline of the road. It's about a mile the whole way. A mile in, a mile out, and then so back, I mean, 6.45 to be done, and then, tra and then drive over to Maxine Circle. And Sounds very healthy. Okay. Is that okay? Yes, yeah, sir. Can you? Yeah, please. So, is there is there going to be a different principal use for this property besides the solar panels, or is this go, is this site going to be dedicated to just solar production? And the house appears to be staying, and so that was what raised the question. Wow. So there's what 130 some odd acres you said that you have there, and you're using a fraction of it, most being wetland. Yeah. Are you renting all of it? So we're leasing only what we need, and that's going to be 33 acres, more or less. Which means the property owner could do whatever he wanted with the rest of it, given the use. So we're using the access way 
and we have security fences around our array. So, and the rest is wetlands. So there's not a lot to do there. Um, but, and thank you for bringing this up. <coughs> the, it's not a house, it's kind of a barn that is right by the access way that is staying in. We're not touching that. Okay. That's um, a good question. I think the presumption is that the frontage along Florence Road could potentially, it looks, it appear, I didn't run it, it appears like it could be um, reconfigured, it. carved up as a &R lots, one or two house lots, appears available potentially in the frontage. Okay. That, so the, the presumption is that that building is vacant or not a residential use, is that what you're, okay. There was let's, a house there, it's gone. Yeah, let's, we, we've, barn. we've already continued this, so right. <laughs> let's, That's let's wait till next yeah. time. <laughs> um, but make a note if there's more questions. And, <laughs> all right, thank you. So we will see you on- Monday the 1st. Monday the 1st. Six o'clock time. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Six o'clock. Thank you. All right, moving along. Very patiently. Wait, Monday the first. Yes. You, you can. Yeah. It doesn't matter. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right, folks. We've actually got more stuff to do, believe it or not. So if we could move <laughs> the conversations out. Yeah, I got a telecom meeting on Monday night. That one. Oh no. I'll probably uh, uh, email him. Oh, him. Him. oh yeah, you got Chris out. All right, folks. So. Moving along, um, we've got an informal business or informal presentation from the Williston Northampton School about a new dormitory project. Chuck, is that your presentation? How was that? Is that fun? Will it be Sorry, we'll remote? Go? You'll yeah. be able to do it. Yeah. <laughs> like, right in there. Is this, Am I alone stuff? now? Did everyone leave? I mean, Am I by myself? In, <laughs> <laughs> Is everyone home having dinner and I'm still sitting in a room alone in the dark? So waiting where we're going to do that. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. When was that? Oh, man. I get to leave after for my recusal. Okay, don't you think? When is this? Okay. When so, is, uh, oh, that's just for your wireless? I got you. Okay, yeah. I got it now. 16. Alright, so I will leave. <coughs> is, it, is it at the end or the beginning? So, so I can show up late? Can you make that full screen? Like at a telecom meeting that night? Right up to then he wants to go on a Thursday night and I got a CPA meeting. I mean, it's just unbelievable. Everything just... All right, folks. <laughs> we still got more stuff going on. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. If um, <sighs> not, we'll, we'll work with what we got there. Yeah. Uh, you may have right. to. I'm sorry. Yeah. Jeff and I. All right. Well, we'll try to, do a we can try to make it full screen for you. Uh, I'm Chuck McCullough. I'm the Chief Financial Officer at the Williston Northampton School, and I have Jeff Tannett with me, who is the uh, 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 Director of uh, Planning for the school. And uh, we did this for our last dormitory project, and, uh, and we've also met to, uh, just recently in the last week with the city departments to give them an, over to give them an overview of the next dormitory project that we're planning. And, uh, when we did this a few years ago, uh, we just felt like it was a good thing to just kind of keep you folks informed of what's going on on campus, uh, with the idea being that uh, uh, with a large project going on under, uh, with a large uh, project that's going to be under construction, we just wanted to make sure you were in the loop. So uh, with that, what I'd like to be able to do is, and I'll see if this is going to work or not, maybe not. No, you'll have to page it for okay. me. Okay. Um, down. Yeah. So uh, what I'd like to be able to do is just show you what we have here on campus right here. This is uh, the school's uh, main campus, and I'll just kind of situate everybody. Payson Avenue, Park Street, Main Street, and this area right here is the area that we're, is going to be under construction. And this is where we built the dormitory last year when we finished that uh, project, which is now known as on campus as John Hazen White House. Uh, what we are going to do, and, and the site that we're going to construct another dormitory is right here. So just get situated. This is Payson Lane, Main Street, Brewster Avenue. And there's an open area here on campus that we're referring to as our residential quad. If you know, uh, just a little history on the school. 
uh, we have some uh, dormitory housing on campus and it's you know what we consider to be it's really beyond its life cycle right now and we really need to upgrade uh, student housing if the school is to remain competitive and so we've been in the process of doing that and this is really the last dormitory project we're going to end up uh, pursuing but this is going to be right in this site here uh, to if you can move to the next page Jeff to give you a, a close-up of that area this is uh, the dormitory that we built 10 years ago, or, to, or a little more than that now, on Payson Avenue. And here is Main Street, uh, on Payson Lane, I'm sorry. And this is Main Street. And this is the dormitory that we just recently constructed. This is the net, Brewster Avenue is over on this side. And, what we're, and there's a parking area there right now on Brewster Avenue. And we're going to construct another dormitory which is almost identical to the dormitory that we built here there's going to be 40 students living in this dorm I'll give you a breakdown of what's going to be constructed and I said just some of the high points of it and these were the two faculty residences uh, two faculty residences in each of these structures that service the 40 students that live in the dorm this is going to be the same construction except the housing is off to the back and this is going to be where two faculty residences uh, these this will be two faculty residences and this will be the two other faculty residences. And this will, be the, this will be the place where the students live. This is the residential quad. When it's all done, students will be living in this area and these four dormitories and also the two dormitories on the main quad, Ford Hall and Memorial. So we found like, we find that we're gonna be able to keep the kids in a, you know, in, a, in a concentrated area and not be scattered all over campus on some of the various different dorms that we've had over the years, so. Uh, one, if you could go to the next page, Jeff. This is what it's going to look like from the uh, quad side. So in that grass area I was just showing you. Very similar to the John Hazen White House we just constructed. Uh, but that is what it will look like from the lawn uh, as the students are going to, going to and from campus, uh, the main part of campus. The uh, next page. And this is going to be the two houses. Right in this foreground here is the parking area that's on Brewster Avenue right now. And these are going to be the two residences that will be facing out towards Brewster Avenue. Again, two residences here. This is a four bedroom home, a two bedroom home, then two three bedroom homes in these two residences here. All right, uh, next page. Um, and I, I, what I have in here is a, a layout and certainly I'm you know very willing to just go ahead and send this to you so you can get a chance to see it uh, but this is, these are some of the views this is from a view from our, our neighbor's house we wanted to give them a, uh, a view of what it would look like from their yard uh, we have two neighbors that we've been speaking to mr. and mrs. Salisbury mr. And mrs. Enright uh, both have been uh, we've stayed in constant contact with them to make sure that they know everything we're doing and to try to stay in touch with them regarding when and uh, when the construction is going to take place what issues are going to be ha happening at certain times with the construction so uh, you know when will the construction take place excuse me when will it take place well we're, we're hoping that we're going to start the bid process probably sometime this week uh, we are submitting the final drawings uh, that will be probably uh, to that are going to the building inspector uh, for his inspection and review over the next month. Uh, we met with him last week and he just said as soon as you can get the prints to me. Uh, it's very, again, almost everything that's in this with the exception of a couple of building code changes is almost identical to what we built before. So he, he felt very, uh, pretty confident about uh, what we're looking at. So soon. It's so I would say the bid process starts, you know, we, we will be submitting it out, we will be putting it out to bid. The process of bid, obviously, that takes a while. You know, we would like to think that we would be able to award a bid sometime in late July and have construction start hopefully sometime, uh, you know, in either, yeah, it'll probably be early August would be the, the best case scenario. The ideal thing would be to try to get the foundation into the ground before the winter and get the building buttoned up so that we're not dealing with winter conditions for construction. So um, if you flip to a couple other, these are just some floor layouts too. I just wanted to make sure that you, you're aware that, um, you know, if you had any questions about that, I just wanted to have them readily available. Well, let's go to the, there's two more pages of that, Jeff, and then you can go to the summary page. This is a, so maybe if you can make that just a little bit bigger. 
uh, 40 students per re in the residence, uh, for the residents, uh, student residents, 16 doubles and eight singles, uh, four faculty residents, as I've mentioned. It's about 27,500 square feet. Estimated cost of the total project, both the construction of the dormitory, as well as the quad area, and some additional things that we have to do on campus to accommodate the fact that this space is going to be, uh, obviously it's gonna be under construction for a year. Uh, so we have to make some parking concessions in some other parts of campus. So I'll talk about that in a second. And then the other is uh, just project management. It's going to be done by Williston internally. Mr. Tannett will be the project manager, and he's, he's worked very closely with the building inspector. Uh, they know each other very well, I think, at this point. And uh, the other things I would say that uh, you, you want to make sure that the project includes, just to emphasize and summarize, is the dormitory construction in these residences, completion of that residential quad, which has been a pretty important part of our uh, overall plan to get the kids in one area. And then we have some relocated parking. If you can go to the next uh, page. Uh, and uh, this was just a, 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 a schedule which we've already touched on. You know, general contract award by 719, that already, I think we're gonna be, uh, that, is, that is already, we're probably not gonna hit that, we're gonna be later than that. And then uh, mobilize, you know, we had late, late July, but it's probably gonna be more like uh, early August. Substantial completion, we wanna see sometime in late July, so that we have time to get uh, faculty moved in and get it ready for the kids. And then the last- mean, Is that, uh, sorry to interrupt, is that off by a year? Yes. Does that 20? Twenty. Yes. Okay. It should be twenty. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And that's me preparing the slides, not somebody who actually has a clue. So. <laughs> so. Um, now, uh, this is just a, just as I mentioned that there's some other needs for some parking because the area of Brewster Avenue is going to be uh, consumed with the construction area. There's tw there's parking for about 20, 23 kids there right now, and that's where the junior day students park right now. So uh, we're going to not be able to use that next year, so we need to have the kids park somewhere else. So we're looking at our parking area uh, uh, next to the public safety complex, which is right next to our Scott Hall Science and Theater building. and. Uh, so we're looking at the existing parking. This is the existing parking lot that we have right now. And it's starting to get pretty tired. There's some problems with the, uh, with the parking lot. So on the next page, Jeff, if you can move it. Uh, it's to, uh, we're, we're able to find that we're gonna be able to, with a new design, we're gonna be able to create somewhere between 20 and to 23 uh, additional parking spaces in this space to accommodate the additional parking that's going to be needed. Uh, while these kids are not going to be able to park up at Brewster, they now can park in this area here. Uh, frankly, we need the parking anyway, so this isn't really uh, uh, building stuff that's only needed for a year. It's actually going to be needed overall anyway. Uh, we have this plan in right now, and I think that's under uh, review. I think we're probably going to see it back. It's f review is being finalized any day now with the city engineer, so uh, and gave us some pretty good input and some suggestions on uh, what we would need to do to make it work and uh, will it be coming before us at that point when it's um, final? I, I wouldn't say at this point right now. It doesn't don't require it's required or not. To, doesn't uh, require it, it, The stormwater management falls under the city engineer if there's no reason for it to have to come before you okay. uh, and I believe that's how that falls so he came out we dug a test pit he came out and monitored that um, our engineer went through the, the process to do all the calculations. He has all those now and is reviewing those. Okay. Right. The our, best of our knowledge, that's all that's required for this. I concur. Yes. I concur. That's, that's how what the I other want projects to have come through <laughs> as well. Yeah. Yeah. Which makes this a generous thing for you to let us know what's going on. I just want to say, personally, I'm grateful. Thank you. Well, well thank you. I mean, and uh, we will say this that uh, we had a chance to meet with the. Uh, 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 city department, all members of the city departments last week, and um, as was the la last time we built the building, incredibly helpful, really thoughtful uh, suggestions and input, and uh, we, we take those to heart. So we want to make sure that um, when we start the project that it's uh, in keeping with everything that, you know, at least those folks think are, is smart. So you uh, might have appreciated questions. That. Excuse me? I have a few questions for you, Please if you do. don't mind. And yeah. these are things I just don't know. I, I never went to Williston. Yeah. Oh, how many students do you have? 
Uh, 490, about 480 to 490 is what 480, 490? Yeah. Yeah. That said 40 new students, and I think there were some new staff in there. Are you looking to expand with this, or are you looking for placement for some, uh, you know, living conditions for existing? Yeah, You're well, not going to go above 480, 490. The latter. We're staying at the same size. We're not growing the school. We don't want to grow the school. You know, you have, you know, there's um, enough challenges in managing an institution of, you know, 480, 490 kids. And uh, what we're doing is we're trying to replace and upgrade some of the places where the kids are living. Again, as I said, I think earlier, we just got to remain competitive. It's uh, uh, for those who don't know, we're an incredibly competitive marketplace, and uh, we have to just stay on our. Uh, we just have to put our best foot forward. And particularly, living spaces are one of the key areas when kids are touring schools and families are touring schools. How old are the kids that you have? Uh, the boarding students are all high school age, so the boarding students are only from 9 to 12. We also have a middle school, which is just day students, that's 7 and 8. But so uh, I asked that because you mentioned the parking spots, the 20 additional. Yep. And it, of course that stood out to me if it had come before me that 20 might be small for something that had 40 plus more. But a lot of these kids aren't driving. Right. So that's yeah. really the... Yeah, yeah. The, par the driving really is for kids who are, you know, in their junior year when they get cars. I mean, the beginning of the year we don't need as many parking spaces, it's just hilarious how many spaces we need as the year goes on. Kids get their licenses and they need to drive. So the juniors we have been parking up in, uh, uh, up in the Brewster area and the seniors had been parking down in the, uh, the uh, lot down off of Payson Avenue. With all, next year they're all going to be parking on Payson Avenue. Great. Which is good. And in some cars, the cars are for day students only, so yep. the dormitories, it doesn't change the number of cars uh, yep. at all. Great. Yeah, here. I got a question, but it doesn't pertain to this. Yeah. Uh, whatever happened to your uh, solar project? Uh, the well, we, we're. <laughs> you, you got an hour? <laughs> yeah. We've had two false starts, and actually, we're right. As a matter of fact, I was on the phone just. Here. We're in the process of investigating it again, uh, and uh, we actually made some pretty good headway in the last two months with. Um, Eversource. Originally, Eversource had some engineering changes that they wanted to put in to our plan, which, uh, frankly, our supplier that we were working with had never seen before. So we tabled the project, uh, also in part because Eversource didn't get our application processed in time. Uh, I think there were a number of people who were in that pro in that situation with the first project, and uh, we now have it designed, and we're talking to. Uh, we've had somebody investigate that. Eversource has changed their engineering requirements that have made this more palatable again. So we're actually just back into the process of looking into getting it up and running. So will that, will that new school and that roundabout have any effect on that at all? Um, not that I know of, no. I mean, the, the roundabout is, you know, it's, it's a section of property and uh, since we knew it's, it's going to have some impact on it, there's no doubt about it. There's some additional uh, land space that was going to be used for solar array that with taking that section of the property off and handling it and making sure that the, it can accommodate the roundabout, there will no longer be a solar array on that property. And that's okay. I mean, we've, we, we've been talking to the city long and hard about that. And that's that's our next item on, on the agenda. Piece of yeah, we'll talk about Is that. It? Yeah. <laughs> Patience. Yeah. yeah, he's right. But uh, so yeah, just so I just wanted everyone to know about this project. It's uh, you'll see it as the fur start flying probably in the next month or month or two. So all right, great, thank Congratulations. you. Congratulations. All right, next up, as I mentioned, is a review of the discontinuance of Brewster Avenue. I am going Chuck. to recuse myself since Wilson is a firm client of mine, and I am going to go home. <laughs> Have a lovely evening, Jesse. <laughs> thank so you. Good luck to all of you. I'll take over from here. Uh, this appears to be a review of the discontinuance of the Brewster Avenue as a public way pursuant to Chapter 41, <coughs> Section 81. Jeez, what is that, an I? It's an I. 81I. I have a letter from you here, Jeff. Uh, did you guys, were you a part of uh, presenting for this, or is this our own internal discussion, Jeff? Um, the memo that you have is a copy of the memo that was provi is provided to the City Council. So it provided some of the baseline information that you might need for this discussion. Okay. So the memo, the memo covered more than you will be covering tonight. Okay. Good. <laughs> so um, I did pull up um, MGL Chapter Forty One, Section Eighty One I. Okay. And I think just to preface it, I w I don't have a large presentation, but I can frame the discussion a little bit. Please do. Um, <laughs> 
what what has come to our attention is that in discontinuing a public way, um, a city or town either has an official map or it does not have an official map. And so what it appears to our records is that the city does not have an official map pursuant to this section. So what it says is that, um, um, so we are a city and we have a planning board, um, but we do not have um, an adopted official map. Um, so it says that no public way in this case shall be discontinued unless the proposed laying out alteration relocation or discontinuance has been referred to the planning board um, which has 45 days um, after which sorry I'm this is I'm trying to cut out some of the legal mumbo jumbo basically you have 45 days to provide your advisory opinion to the City Council so we're making a recommendation correct so we have to evaluate this discontinuance of that property and of course, in order to do that, we need to understand why it's happening, and it's happening as part of a negotiation. I think it's yeah, it's happening as part of a proposed. It's a part of a proposal. Mm -hmm. um, I think that your task is a little bit ambiguous because there's not a lot of case law or um, guidance available. But what you're what you're being asked to do is evaluate whether there's a whether there's something that you would like the city council to understand or know or consider if Brewster Ave were not a public way anymore. Okay, so so trying to limit the scope, uh, which I think is a good idea for us all here, I had said that it, it ha helps to understand what's behind this, that there's a negotiation underway. I, I think that's true, but realistically, it's not our role in any way in this to involve ourselves or ask questions about what that negotiation, why they're negotiating. I mean, obviously we know there's a roundabout, they need to take some uh, some some of that land to, to put it in there to make it easier for traffic for the school to flow right. um, and that in negotiation for that land rather than imminent domain uh, there's been some sort of trade-off that Brewster away would be discontinued as being public property and become part of their private property our role in this discussion is solely please correct me if I'm wrong to look at is there a reason why it should not become private property? Is there something that no one else is seeing? Right. We're, we're kind of vetting it for the city council to alert them to anything that, that uh, may be a red flag. Is that Am I right about that? Yes. And I think the city council has the, the task of weighing the pros and cons of the proposed scenarios where you're just looking at what if this were not a public way anymore? And I do, I do want to say that there are two documents that I don't know um, you currently have, and I'd like to get them off the table. There's a letter from the chief of police and a letter from um, the chief of the fire department that I would ask that you would either read them into the record yeah. or. Just Are they in here in this packet? I don't remember um, seeing no, them. They're not in the packet that was provided for the city council. <coughs> Uh, yeah, absolutely, Mike. Go ahead. I'm uh, just questioning. Yeah, please. What, what you understand what you're being asked? Uh, not yet. <laughs> I'm working on it. Uh, because, I mean, I understand. I'm working now to decipher what the task is. What I'm not, what I'm lacking in terms of information right now is how to approach answering the question. Uh, you know, how how to look at, and this is something that I think we'll all need to discuss and maybe take some time to research. I don't think we'll come up with an answer at this meeting today. May I speak? Uh, uh, please come okay. forward. But in, in terms of, in terms of your task. yeah, how do we accomplish the task? How do we look at it and say this is a red flag? This isn't. That's something I need to study. I need to figure it out. Um, so my own my input to the board really is that I think your task is to look at it from the subdivision zoning side of the question. And so to be honest, I'm guessing that if I were sitting in your seat, I would be wondering: We have a public way. There are lots on a public way. Uh, do those lots require frontage to be legal, or don't they? Um, does this new dormitory on Brewster Avenue require frontage to legally be constructed or not? If you don't have a public way, do you still have frontage? Um, and so I guess you're looking to I make would sure ask you the rules. to look at whether or not that not being a public way breaks any law yeah. or forces any properties to become non-conforming. Yeah, non-conforming, that's perfect. Because I think that fits what your role is. Uh, you know, if I came in and said, hey, I want to I want to put a house on, in, a, in the middle of a field that didn't have any street frontage, you'd probably tell me no. And I don't know whether eliminating street frontage to existing properties makes them illegal. I presume it does, but um, I'm not an attorney. 
Okay. For the record, can you state who you are? I'm sorry. I don't oh, know. I'm sorry. Mike Tausnick. <laughs> I live at 166 Hendrick Street. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Well, that's that's interesting. And for me, that's very helpful because it narrows down a point. I mean, I, in my head, I was thinking about some other elements of it, too, which are kind of on the inverse in that there are expenses for a public way, things like plowing and uh, you know, service hookups, things like that, that, that would weigh into that as well, that we're actually benefiting from, I would think, in this case, because we're, you know, it, it's up to them to plow it now if it's not a public way, right? And that's something that, and, and that's kind of a question to me, normally if someone had a private property, you know, we'd go through an approval process and ask, well, how are you plowing it? How are you, how are you mitigating these things? And if we just make it a private way without a process like that, do we even have the does the ability exist anymore to make sure that they're going to take care of it or that, you know? Just respond to Please, yeah. I mean, I can give you a little bit of guidance. Um, the, uh, <coughs> it's no long, uh, this is Chuck McCullough again, uh, uh, Chief Financial Officer of Willis Northampton. Uh, it, to his point, yes, absolutely. If it's a, not a public, you have to have some other means to be able to access it. But we're dealing with that all the time on campus, where we have to make sure that fire lanes, access, all those things have to be able to be done, uh, regardless of whether it's a public way or not. I mean, that's, you know, it's almost a moot point. You know, any, anything that we do, we have to make sure that we're meeting any of those requirements. So, you know, whether it's, whether it's a public way or if it's a private way, and if there are buildings such as what we're constructing now, very easily done because we have to make sure there are fire lanes, uh, access to the homes, access to any of those areas. So that's um, it's a pretty easy, easy standard for uh, a public, uh, public or private way to meet. So if it becomes a private way, it's not a throughway anymore. So the yeah. public cannot use it as a cut through like I do. Candidly, really you know, it's the the main the main reason for this is just pure safety. Yeah. Now it's yeah. just uh, you know I, I can tell you for a fact that and I I'm on that road all the time and I can tell you that I just followed somebody this morning just this afternoon after lunch. I went down that way and took, I'm driving about 21 miles an hour, which is the posted speed limit, uh -huh. and the person in front of me was going easily 40 miles an hour. Oh, that's and that's a, the biggest concern, is we have more kids living the there, city. and another dorm across the street that we're going to be dealing with. That's, that's a big concern right now. Jim? Yeah, that's a huge concern. Safety. City. Be before you sit down, yeah, yeah. do you have any, are, are there, to your knowledge, any privately owned homes on that? No. On Bruce Way, it's all no, Lewiston's yeah. property. Oh, that's all, a good question. It's all the uh, school property at this point. Okay. Yeah. What are you going to do, or what is the plan to make it so that you can't pass through anymore? Are you going to blockade an end of the street, or how? really don't know? I, I mean, I think the first thing is, you know, we're, we're you know we're doing the dormitory, and the dormitory is sort of separate from this. But we did some uh, we did some project work on that road last year in in, uh, in uh, concert with the city. Uh, but beyond that, we, we really don't have plans yet. I think the one thing we want to look at is um, mitigating the speed in which cars are, are driving through there. But I don't, I really honestly don't have a plan. We've heard many, many plans from different architects and different designs, but we, you know, having some control uh, of that to be able to uh, control some of the speed, that's going to be one of the most important things. And that and the fact that the hill is pretty steep right now. Uh, and in the winter, you know, is there a way for us to be able to maybe smooth that out, maybe make it more gradual? So okay. those are some of the things we're thinking about. So, you know, I think that the frontage discussion, thank you, sorry, the frontage discussion and the non-conforming discussion, I think that's a valid one. And, and I think it would behoove us to have a map to look at to see if we could, uh, for that street, is that something that the planning department can... Well, so in the, in the, in the packet, there is a, a map of Rooster Court as it exists today. I mean, the... The presumption at the moment is that um, because all the properties that, that abut the public way, this one here, uh, there should be one after that. There this should one? be one at Brewster Court. Yes, mm -hmm. the so. satellite map. Yep. Well, uh, I'm looking for one that will show frontage. Right. What I was getting at is, I think the presumption at the moment is that um, if all the properties are owned by Williston and become part of the Williston property then I think that there's a the presumption that the frontage requirements are not applicable because right. it becomes a campus of all the same ownership okay. where those property lines could be removed and have the conglomerate of, of all the uses that are currently there. Are so you suggesting that we make a recommendation to re to merge the property lines and zoning as part of this? Because you said they could be removed. Until they're removed, aren't they technically, they would still need to come before us 
to to have an ANR or whatever it is that they're doing, right? I, I have a I have a you know I it's, maybe it's worth something to pursue further details. I have a difference of opinion as to the gentleman who spoke before that um, the matter it, before the board is the discontinuance of the way. Whether or not frontage is a resulting question, that's that's fair. But I don't think you know your job is to determine whether they're going to be in compliance or not compliance with zoning. I think your job is to advise the city council whether there's a problem or an impact by not having it be a public way. So, so, I, is that, so does the, that mean traffic? I take exception yes, with I that. that. I think that if there's going to be a problem and, and we have the ability to isolate it, we should at least make, I mean, ultimately city council makes a decision, but if we're making something non-conforming, that's certainly not, not a good result. And we should present that flag. Yeah, and the presumption again is that without this you know, this being a public way, those those lots could all become merged with Williston property and there's no nonconformity, you know, at issue. There's no need for those to I be. I agree with that, except lots. for the word could. Right. What does that mean? Are we doing it and then it's not a problem, which is easy. You know, are they just merging all those lots and, and we're and right. that's part of our recommendation to city council, or are we not merging the lots and then they still need the A and R and then we're creating possible nonconformity and making a mess. Right. We shouldn't make messes. Yeah, I agree. I think if we make a recommendation, it would be that the applicant, or the, this, this not the applicant, but in this scenario, that the that the properties are merged, so it becomes one Williston property with frontage on. That has ramifications. Park Street or that, Main I mean, Street. that that has big ramifications. Please do come up. Uh, with a number of our properties already, um, we have. We have done exactly as you just outlined, that we've merged the boundaries. Yeah. We, we've eliminated the boundaries between properties. Uh, that whole area that I showed you where the residential quadrangle is, those were a series of other properties and those, those boundaries were eliminated. And you know, we've, you know, we've just done that as a matter of course in a number of areas where it made sense. And uh, it's certainly in this area, if the Brewster uh, Avenue property became uh, Brewster Avenue, the street itself became a school property, then we would do the same thing again. Yeah. We would probably just eliminate those boundaries. It would so make I'm, sense. So then that the road would just be an access road on their property, essentially. So I think part of our recommendation then should be that that occur yeah. as part of this. I agree. Which would eliminate the potential nonconformity that was brought up. And, and you're willing to, if we make that recommendation, that's all. It's a matter of course. Okay. Well, that takes care of that. Just on the street. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh, you'll forgive me, I, I don't mean to be a pain in the ass, but I do consider it a little bit of my job t to be <laughs> a pain in the butt. Okay. So, uh, anyone else think of anything else that we need to look at as a flag here? What, what else? Well, I, think, I, think, I think you touched on the access or emergency vehicle access or, or general access by the public. So I think there's three, three quick questions there, two of which I presume would be answered by reading the letter from the Chief of Police and the Chief of the Fire Department. Well, did you throw those at me? Yep. Yeah, oh, he did. I will, I will offer, although it's, it's informal, it is an email from the Director of Public Works, um, which you know identifies, so I have this email, it's, it's from Joe Kavinsky, it's dated um, today, it's dated today at 8.30 a.m., um, and it's addressed to the mayor, so I have a copy I will submit. Um, it, it identifies that Brewster Court is approximately 720 feet long, and represents less than six, uh, one, uh, one sixth, uh, point six, point sixteen percent, point one six. Sorry, represents zero point one six percent of the city's total road length. Uh, proportionately, the annual reduction in Chapter ninety apportionment would be about eight hundred dollars. The DBW does not feel that the loss of that Chapter ninety money would be greater than the cost of maintenance, including snow removal. Uh, the actual time spent on maintenance would depend on the discontinuance agreement. So that's some other factors I think that would be for the city council. He, he to worded that a bit oddly. Could you yeah, repeat like that? Double it was double problem. negative. That's what I caught. It does not feel that it would. Is he saying that we're not going to make enough money? We're going to lose money in this, or we're okay? No, I, mean, I think the intent is that um, the total road length would amount to about eight hundred dollars worth of chapter ninety that's, revenue. That's yeah. how much that would come in, which is less than the actual cost of the city to maintain it. So okay. it's, so it's not a substantial cost savings. You know, elimination of Chapter 90 funds. I think that We're already paying more. Up. It's not enough to maintain. Yeah, and I think that's the way Chapter 90 works, is that yeah. Chapter 90 is never enough to actually pay for okay. the actual cost of road maintenance. Okay. So I think this is trying to reflect that. Okay. Um, it does talk about 
um, water and sewer easements um, you know are, are anticipated in this where the utilities would remain in the ground and there would be easements for the city to access those um, so it's, it says given giving Willis in the street provides them control and would allow um, them to change traffic patterns to and from Main Street and Park Streets um, depending on what they decide to do with the roadway so I think that that's really the ultimate task for the plan board is to consider this as if the road will not we're not a public way and those easements you mentioned um, making it and discontinuing it as a public way that wouldn't eliminate the easements they would still exist they, I believe that they'd have to be created as right. part of the they have to be added be in a set of easements created oh joy and that's something that would be before the city council right we, so we'd make a recommendation that the easements be created right and it would be um, done as a matter of course regardless right, right. so then I'll read this in uh, that you handed me from uh, Chief Alberti Chief of Police uh, Planning Board I have reviewed the plan for the Brewster Avenue discontinuance as it relates to the Park Street acquisition for the roundabout near Whitebrook Middle School which will serve as the new K through 8 school as such I will support the City Council resolution for the discontinuance of Brewster Avenue from a public safety perspective, I do not believe there is a negative impact on public safety for the discontinuance of Brewster Avenue. In fact, the preferred response from Main Street to the downtown area is by way of Center Street to Park Street to Payson Avenue. We typically do not respond to emergencies via Brewster Avenue. After speaking with Williston CFO McCullough, I am satisfied that if Williston were to receive Brewster Avenue in a land exchange with the city, Public safety will be included in whatever new design proposals will be for this property on Brewster Avenue. This will include access for public safety in this area and for existing structures as well as new proposed dormitories there. Please feel free to contact me with further questions or if you require additional information, respectfully submitted, Chief Alberti. So that's all in good standing. Um, well, I'd imagined this would be a bit more of a process. Um, but I'm not seeing anything else. Do you want to come on up? I do have something to add. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see you. I'll have you go next. My apologies. Sorry. J.P. Kwasinski, 47 Hannenbrook. Um, in thinking about the possibilities here, we have the request, or we'll have the request before us for the discontinuance of the road. I'm wondering who owns the, all the infrastructure under the road. I presume it's the city right now up to the lot lines. Is that one question of who owns the infrastructure? Whether any infrastructure comes down off of Main Street to Park Street or what the city has there, and whether we need an easement or don't need an easement, or whether if I, as I understand it, if the road is discontinued, the 35, I believe it's 35 feet of road and anything that may be a side of the road becomes part of the property owners on either side if the road is discontinued. Wouldn't the infrastructure underneath revert to the, the private? The private. Yeah. No. So you're then questioning become the need, theirs to maintain. Questioning the need the for the I'm, I'm just wondering if you guys have any thoughts on that subject, uh, and I think it's something that we ought to explore before pursuing this. So that's my question. So the, the, the utilities underground remain the owner. The, the city remains the owner of the utilities because I, they are connected to the larger so. grid. So yeah. then, typically, if, we're we don't own private the utilities under private property. You do if you have an easement underneath. So, so you would have to, the city would have to work with Williston to get an easement for those utilities so that they could uh, access them and maintain them as necessary. If they serve the only it. the properties in question. But they don't. I mean, I don't, I don't the know whether they do or they don't. The whole city, so it doesn't just serve the properties yeah. underneath yeah. that street. Now maybe, I mean, if somebody has some expertise yeah. in that area, yeah. I think it would be I, I agree. <laughs> I was going to let you go next, but I think a response is necessary. Yeah, sure. Do you mind? Okay, please do come up. And... Uh, Jeff Tannett, 83 Park Street. Uh, the sewer line on the street uh, does only service the residents on that street. and. We could choose to take that over to where 
to Main Street where it enters the city sewer and not do an easement for that. The one of the main uh, positives for the new eight inch water line that we put down the street last year besides being necessary for the dormitory uh, is that it ties the city water line on Main Street and Park Street uh, together and that water is not metered at that point or anything so the certainly the water line is infrastructure uh, that the city would need to continue to have access uh, to, to own to and, own and have operate. access to right. and certainly granting that easement uh, uh, we would have to do the same for uh, Columbia gas uh, for the two inch plastic uh, gas line that runs down the street uh, the sewer could be done either way as is it, there storm water old sewer if the city wants us to have to deal with it it's it's only our sewage you know running through to where it hits main street is there and a storm have, water system what's that is there a storm water system a collection system for the storm water? Uh, storm water system uh does uh, go down the street and and actually uh, dumps into wilton brook uh before it hits uh park street um so that that could be done uh, either way as well that could you know we'd be happy to work with the city uh, either way um, if there's an advantage okay. and, and a reason that they want to continue to do that if if they want to push the maintenance of that uh, to us uh, that would not not be an issue but certainly the the water line going down the street uh, the the water line in Park Street is not in good shape uh, so if there's issues on Park Street by having that tie it allows them to to cut off a smaller section if they ever had to do a repair uh, and, and certainly that uh, that I think would the city would want to uh, maintain ownership of that okay and again I think you know it, it's if the Thank city you. had an official map um, of the roads that are public ways then this process would begin and end with the city council so i just want <clears throat> to be clear that these are good advisory recommendations so i've got a list of three so far um, and if we come up with a couple more that's fine um, with this one i think the recommendation is is something that will be considered by the city council and its property subcommittee but it's the consideration of ownership and maintenance of all the underground infrastructure you know, if it is discontinued and conveyed to Williston, that is something that the city council needs to ensure is adequately addressed, right? So I think that's what you just heard. Yeah, we did have a, one of the city council members, um, Mr. Kaczynski, uh, request some detail on our thought process and what we thought about the easements there. I, I think that you actually just gave us some great detail about what's possible, and I, and I you know, I hope have, have the rest of the city council review the footage. Uh, because I think that's really helpful. It looks like sewage could be taken off the list, but everything else should be made an easement was my take on that. Um, now you've been very generous in waiting. And no, please sorry. go ahead. Uh, the, is, it, is, it our, is it a recommendation that we could make too to evaluate the tr impacts to traffic? If, because if that, this is now going to come off the table for access for the public, I imagine there's going to be a lot more traffic on Ward Street, I think, is the street immediately um, to the west or north of that, Greenwood. and then Greenwood Court. Greenwood. Thank you. Um, and then um, I, I, I'm just wondering if there's any sort of recommendations to the council to evaluate traffic impacts by taking that out of service. I think it's. Or is that off of our? Is that not our jurisdiction? Well, we can, no, we could make the recommendation. I'm not sure how they would go about that. Me I mean, either. there's not like going to. Who's going to pay for a traffic study, right? <laughs> well, I think right. It's, I think if it's on something that gets a list of recommendations, I think you know it's it's important to note that Brewster Ave is one way, so it'll be a limited amount of traffic that uses the road for cut through. So um, the you know this is not a uh, function of the planning board that happens often. And, yeah. And uh, as I well, tried well, to allude to the. That's what I'm trying to figure out what that kind yeah. of gives you yeah. clear Maybe guidance. you have some information for us. In, in all the building that occurred in that way, did you ever have a traffic study for that street? We have not. No? Traffic study. So you, is it that we know that the high traffic times are in the morning, which are uh, a combination of commuters and uh, our families that are coming into the middle school. Uh, towards the end of the day, uh, we see you know, people are going the other way. As Jeff just mentioned, it's 
one way, so you're not seeing as much traffic. But certainly in the morning, you know, you're seeing a lot of uh, a lot of people getting through. Mm -hmm. Okay. Nothing, it's anecdotal, nothing, but it's the up, best we've yeah. got. Um, did I see a hand somewhere? Yeah. Please go ahead. You okay for back here? Or well, no, they yeah. got to hear us at home. You know yeah, how it yeah, is. Record it. <laughs> 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 yeah, I should have made you go up too. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah, I, I guess based on Jeff's comments that you, you part of your purview should be public access. And so um, I, I think it's important. I don't live in the neighborhood. I don't use it for commuting. I use it once a, I use it once a week. Um, so I don't know what the impact is going to be. The reason I use it is because the intersection at Greenwood Court on Park is more dangerous. Oh, okay. um, you have poor sight line over the bridge, um, and it, it's just so much easier to take Brewster. Um, and it brings me closer. Generally, I'm coming down to Payson or I'm coming to downtown, and it's, I'm, I'm already closer. Mm -hmm. um, and so if, if your concern is if your purview extends to the motoring public, it would be useful to understand how many people actually use the road. I agree with that. The problem, though, is that we're making recommendations. So we can say, you know, to the city council, we recommend that you look into traffic. I'm not sure what they can do about right, it. Right. That's, that, exactly. that's that's where it all falls apart. Right. And, and what is know, our purview? That's yeah. the thing. That's that's what we're trying to figure out. I guess. So so I don't think it's out of the, I don't think it's out of the question to make a recommendation that as part of the city council's deliberation and consideration that they, they evaluate or consider the potential impact of changing traffic, traffic patterns. Yeah. And I don't think that that's yeah. out of the realm of a recommendation that the city council and its subcommittees look at. So. Add it in. <coughs> Anyone else got anything good for us? I'm going to go. He, he was closer to the mic, so I'll give him. <laughs> uh, that brought up the, the wondering of what happened with regard to the Payson and Brewster in terms of the history of being one or two ways. Uh, the little section off of Park Street onto Main Street is one way now. Mm -hmm. I imagine it was two ways was. at one time. I imagine maybe Brewster might have been two ways at one time, and the thought came up, geez, the traffic pattern might be that, well, why don't we put a one-way here and a one-way there, and that really kind of balances out, and it's pretty close to one another, and you won't have to go to, so I'm, th I'm wondering what effect, balance. whether that affects the balance of Payson and Brewster now to consider closing that street so I mean for just a me, thought to throw onto the table as a planning board member what I'd need normally to evaluate this is a traffic study yeah and that shows <laughs> how much traffic on this street how much on that street and you know I mean that's it's definitely my recommendation you're putting that down already that the City Council find a way to make that happen good luck <laughs> well, well I think I think the the recommendation need not be super specific I don't know that anyone has enough information to say that a traffic study is necessary I think your your recommendation would be that the City Council and its subcommittees evaluate the potential impacts to traffic patterns as part of their process right and, and I think figure out what the scope of that is I, I, I do not know that a traffic study is necessary to determine the pattern here um, it may be and that may be what the City Council ultimately I'll just say this decide. personally for me it would be I, I just want you know how, how else can I say anything? If it's a concern for me for traffic, how can I evaluate it anecdotally? I can't. I, I need evidence. So for me, it would be. Yeah. I'd be one thing, I think, if this was way on the outskirts of, of the city that didn't have a lot of traffic or, or impact to the downtown, but this potentially does. So, but, you know, I think that you can take that back. <laughs> All right, besides traffic, um, we've talked about the easements. Um, I'm not sure what else we talked about uh, making some the property lines properties. all merge. Yeah. Yeah. Right, so I had jotted some language down. So the recommendation would be um, that the city council and its subcommittees ensure that all measures be taken by Williston upon conveyance to eliminate or prevent the creation of any zoning violations, i.e. frontage requirements. Yeah, non-conforming. So non-conforming is the word to use in there. That made sense. Um, we have the recommendation to consider the ownership and maintenance of underground infrastructure which automatically talks easements. about easements mm -hmm. and, and the nature of those. I think we might want to, I'm not quite sure, we're keeping it generic, but it came out in this conversation that sewage might be something that could be taken off of easement, and I'd like to pass that message on. 
Yeah, it's kind of a city engineer question, I think, of what he wants to, yeah. what, what he's but willing just to... just put it on their radar, that, you know, they'll evaluate let it. Let go of for maintenance. Okay, so that would be <coughs> the consideration of ownership and maintenance of underground infrastructure, including the possibility of removing sewer from um, city maintenance responsibilities? Yeah, just con like the conveyance of that sewer lateral uh, on the street. I didn't hear what you said. Uh, stormwater, is that and stormwater? Can you talk about that too? Yeah, that's, that's potential easement. Potentially, as long as it's not connected to the rest of the system. If the stormwater is a direct outlet to a pond, then that's one thing, but if it's connected to the overall stormwater system, then that's probably this, this a different. This all feels weird to me. This, this feels like we're passing the buck in a way that I'm not used to passing the buck, and I don't <laughs> like it. Uh, it, it. This whole thing makes me feel really uncomfortable. I feel like we should dig in and conquer these problems, but I, I you know, I, I don't know. we well, can't. That's, that's not our role. Not our role. Yeah, so what are you going to do? I think your role is <laughs> to take these elements and recommend that the city council dig into it's these elements. I mean, the way it the, is. The, yeah. the <laughs> case law, I mean, the, the provision of MGL doesn't really give you the, it doesn't seem to give you the authority to 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 obtain all this anything, information. It's right. to recommend that uh, the city council consider it all and possibly Jimmy, obtain it. put the monkey on your back. So <laughs> the last one, I just want to see if I can close this up. The last one is to ensure that all public safety access requirements are met in the implementation of future use of um, Brewster Ave. So I think that's reflective of the Chief of Police. Okay, and is that also the traffic, the traffic evaluation, is it included in that? Well, I would consider the two items separate. Um, I think I just didn't hear it. your traffic consideration is to the general public who might yep. use this as a cut through, and then there's public safety access, mm -hmm. you know, and, and them being involved in the discussion of Williston's future. Yep. Plan, yep. so. I just didn't I know that so just the only other thing that I could think to add, given that you had that traffic bit, is maybe a couple of notes, just some data points that we collected. For instance, there are no private, they're all, all the properties there are owned by Williston, there are no private, I think that's a question they may ask, and if we could provide that data point, it may be handy. Yep. Um, that's pretty much it, really. Yeah, I don't want to downplay that, I think that that it's comes just, off quickly with the assessor has a, a determined that all the sure. properties are owned by Wilson, so mm -hmm. I, I, that makes sense to Just me. trying to help as much as I can, so I, I, you know. All right, do we have a recommendation? What's the recommendation? Just well, he just read off those points. The gentleman has a... <laughs> Please, come on up. Just one other data point, just in, in terms of uh, in lieu of somewhat of a, a traffic study. Uh, when last summer, when we put the new water line down the street and repaved, um, we had that road virtually closed down for close to a month. Okay. Um, and if Joe Pipsinski and the police chief were not getting a lot of complaints, uh, and, and we didn't, uh, then uh, honestly, I expected more um, and, and didn't. Uh, I know people that drive that road every day as, as a cut through that very quickly found alternatives uh, and it was not a negative impact. Again, that is not a formal traffic study or anything, but, but, then, uh, but, but that kind of feedback um, informs the process. As you know, the negative feedback tends to come pretty quickly. Okay. So, just one other point. That, Okay. Does anyone else want to add anything? No? Okay. So I think that our, I mean, in terms of yes or no, do this, that's really up to the city council. We're just pointing these, these you know, pieces to consider. I think we've got a good bunch there, enough to make a solid recommendation. Did we miss anything? No, but I'm wondering what the record, are we just recommending these? We recommend that in, in deciding whether to make this a uh, private way, not, uh, discontinue it as a public way, that they consider these points that we've raised. Is that decent? Yeah, so I that believe be a, so. It doesn't I mean, be a form, like a form of motion, though. It's just a, are we just oh, discussing I, it, right? I, uh, no, I think we should, I think we should uh, agree to send this as a recommendation to the city council by way of motion. All right, um, I move that we um, uh, recommend the uh, discussion by the City Council of Brewster uh, Ave with the c considerations mentioned and noted on Jeff's. Is there a second? Let's I'll second it. Any discussion? 
All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any against or abstentions? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Who seconded that? Uh, that was Chet. Harry. It's Harry, sorry. <laughs> the other Chet. You're in his seat. Okay. Thank you very much. Let's move on. Uh, I don't think we have much left. Jesse left, so we don't have to call him back. We have uh, next meeting Tuesday, July 9th, 219 at 6 p.m. Uh, what's on the agenda for that meeting, Jeff? Um, the application that has been submitted is for property on Union Street um, that was approved by the ZBA to construct a three-car, two-story garage, and they want to add a dwelling unit, okay. which requires planning board, planning board approval of a multifamily dwelling. So hmm. That's currently the application that's been submitted. And that's the only one, right? That's the only one that made that deadline. Okay. And I will be unavailable for that meeting. I'll be traveling. So. Anyone have any announcements? No? And then I'm looking for a motion. I move to adjourn. Any second? I'll take it. <laughs> All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much, everyone.